Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good morning, welcome to The Point on GB News with me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. This morning, it is Thursday, of course, a Conservative MP who offered to leak confidential policy documents and lobby ministers on behalf of gambling investors has had the party whip suspended. Uh, Scott Benson is the MP for Blackpool. He was filmed by The Times offering to help gambling industry lobbyists in exchange for financial reward. We'll explain why this is important. We certainly will. And the Prime Minister is defending the move to house those migrants on that barge off the Dorset coast. Remember, we spoke to local tour MP yesterday, hadn't even been consulted about the plan. Also, hundreds of police officers are expected to be removed from the Met Police as Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley admits in a damning letter that there are officers who just shouldn't be in the force. Do you think the Met is truly able to investigate and reform itself? And they're building in Dover temporary marquees to check passports. They're expecting even more travel chaos coming up. Of course they are. It's Easter after all. That's right. So, um... So we will be talking about that as we look forward to the bank holiday weekend and what it might mean for your travel. We're going to have Simon Calder uh, talking to us as well. He's always brilliant. Uh, email us your thoughts, gbviews at gbnews.uk. But first of all, here is your news with Rhiannon Jones. Good morning. It's 9.31. Your top stories from the GB Newsroom. Counter-terrorism officers, along with those who tackle serious organised crime, have been drafted in to help clean up the Met Police workforce. 
Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley believes there are hundreds of corrupt officers who shouldn't be in the job, and he wants to weed them out. Of more than 1,000 records, nearly 700 cases will be reassessed, with almost 200 referred to formal risk management or vetting. In an update to the Home Secretary, Swella Braverman, the figures also reveal 161 Met officers have criminal convictions. Former Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has pulled out of a climate change event this evening after her husband was released from custody without charge. The home of Miss Sturgeon and the former SNP chief executive remains cordoned off pending further investigation. Peter Murrell was arrested as part of a probe into SNP finances, including £600,000 set aside for Scotland's independence campaign. Miss Sturgeon insists she had no prior knowledge of police plans or intentions ahead of her resignation in February. Sakia Starmer has promised to introduce specialist rape courts if Labour wins the next election. It comes amid a record backlog in the courts, which sees victims face an average three-year wait for justice. Government analysis shows the number of rape survivors dropping their cases has more than doubled since 2015. Sakia will repeat his promise to halve levels of violence against women and girls later when he meets with charities supporting victims in Scunthorpe in North Lincolnshire. And the US president has accepted an invite from the king for a state visit to the UK. The White House says Joe Biden had a very friendly chat with King Charles over the phone. The president's due to visit Northern Ireland and the Republic next week, but won't attend the coronation in May. He'll be represented instead by his wife, Jill. TV online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn, this is GB News. Now it's back to Andrew and Bev. Very good morning. We're going to be talking about um, travel over the weekend. I want to know what you're planning this weekend as it's the a lovely long Easter break. Yeah. Um, good luck if you're going in a car because you'll be <laughs> stuck in a traffic jam for hours. Yeah, good luck if you're going on the train like I was this morning. Extortionately expensive, absolutely packed. Nothing is working. GBviews at gbnews.uk is the email to let us know your stories. Now, uh, first of all, though, Conservative MP Scott Benton. He's had the party whip suspended after being filmed offering to help gambling industry lobbyists in exchange for financial reward. It was an undercover sting by The Times, which revealed he was ready to leak market-sensitive information to an investment fund and ask parliamentary questions. That breaks every single lobbying rule. Mm. So with us this morning is political commentator uh, Piers Pottinger. Uh, good morning, Piers. Um, morning. Andrew and I were discussing this this morning. Why would this be an MP that not a lot of people have heard of, Scott Benson, fairly new MP, with it's got quite a small majority in Black. Tiny. I'm going to check it. Why would it be such a big deal to, to, to the public to make a front page splash? Well, I think if indeed he said all the things he said, that it's claimed he said, um, some aspects of what he said were really very serious indeed. And one particular is um, he offered to release ahead, 40, 48 hours ahead at minimum, mm. the Gambling Commission report to people who were posing as investors in the gambling industry. Now, as the major gambling companies are all listed, quoted public companies, um, their share price would have been enormously affected by what is said in the Gambling right. Commission because people have been waiting for this report for a very long time. Mm. And uh, to volunteer to do something like this breaks so many rules, uh, given he was also the chairman of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Gaming, it's, uh, I'm afraid, his career is over. I mean, he seems hell-bent on <laughs> his self-destruction. If you pardon the I pun. Mean, sorry about <laughs> yes. that. But, I mean, the mm. fact is... He's got a majority, I think, of 3,000 yeah. in Blackpool South. It'll inevitably mean a by-election, which is not what uh, Rishi mm. Sunak would like at this yeah. time. Now, of course, the Labour Party are very quick to jump on this. Uh, but don't forget, the Labour Party MPs are mostly paid and sponsored by the trade unions. Mm. So they're at their beck and call. They're paid servants of a, of a particular group which I personally think is wrong. Uh, so it's very hard for them to criticise MPs taking on extra jobs for more money. Uh, but when you're actually volunteering to break rules in such a really unpleasant way, mm. it's, 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 uh, his career, in my view, is, is over. Now, you advise in your 
public affairs days, some of the leading city companies. Yes, and it, many gaming companies. Yeah, actually. Exactly. And yeah. insider trading is it, it's effectively you can go to prison for it. You can. Um, but I mean, you know, th that's why obviously all government reports that are sensitive to industry and share prices are very strictly guarded. And of course, these days, things tend to leak more than normal. But um, to leak a report of this magnitude, mm. um, 48 hours in advance, uh, is, is, is really extraordinary. And however naive, and I think one of the problems is the calibre of MPs these days is very low. Mm. And I think they need to set the bar a lot higher. Yeah. Because mm. this chap uh, was a primary school teacher briefly, Mm. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's all he did yeah. other than be a professional politician as a councillor and then MP. And, and so often now we're getting this political class of, of government people rather than people who've done something mm. becoming public servants. Will naivety be his defence? Um, and is there any defence in that? Surely no, no, he no. would know that this was going to yeah. be against the rules. Uh, he can't defend himself because there have been so many stings. MPs should be on, on their guard. Yeah. Um, and now major companies have given up because, anyway, they've changed the rules since Owen Patterson. Mm. Um, so major companies don't take on MPs in the way they used to. Because there's so, a bit of a bad smell So, therefore, about it, the but... kind of people mm. coming to MPs mm. you want to be immediately suspicious mm. yeah. of. There's a bit of a bad smell about having an MP on the books of a company these days. Isn't yes, yeah. shareholders don't like it. No. Uh, and um, most, mm. but most companies go out of their way to be politically neutral or at least appear to be. Mm. Um, and in my experience, of in, in the, certainly in the past, when companies have paid MPs as consultants, they've always been very disappointed at what they've got in return for large sums of money. Talking of MPs, Nicola Sturgeon, Scottish First yep. Minister until a week ago, pulled out of a major speech tonight on climate change. When she stood down or announced she was standing down, we talked on this programme, mm. Piers, yep. as a very proud Scot you are, this is all to do with the financial investigation into the S&P. It now seems that's exactly why she went. Yes. I mean, I did. I remember saying it on this programme that I, I was very suspicious of the reason she gave for standing mm. down, and now it would appear obvious what is going on. Um, of course, now they're trying to turn the emphasis on the police, um, which is absurd, because what they actually want to be doing is looking at the, the actual crimes that may have been committed. The rumour in Scotland this morning is that there are other arrests soon to follow. Mm. And I must admit, the police certainly put on a show with a Didn't huge they? tent it looks like and a looking scene. into a barbecue. I, I thought that Bev was... Bevan and I were saying it looks like a scene from Line of Duty. Yes. That's right. You know, I mean, is there a body buried under the patio? Exactly. I mean, they, they certainly made their point. And, um, uh, of course, Sturgeon and Murrell live in Uddingston, the home of the Tunnock's Caramel Wafer, my favourite Scottish uh, confection. <laughs> um, but, I mean, they, 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 it, it, it was extraordinary. And to see them looking in dustbins yeah. uh, and, yeah. and examining the barbecue... Extraordinary. I mean, if, if uh, anyone was hiding anything, you think they'd have done it a long time ago yeah. and not yeah. probably on their own premises. And, it, and it's all to do with £600,000 that where it got spent. Also, That's right. Peter Mur Pete Murray, the chief executive of the S&P, her mm. husband for 10 years... Um, made it, a loan. Two loans. Two loans, which he didn't declare. That's so that's right. all part of the investigation. So, I mean, where's the money gone? There's the, they've been looking at purchases of cars, I've heard, mm. by various SNP people. But, I mean, and Yousaf, don't forget... Mm. Um, the leader. ..is the continuity candidate, as he called himself, and he was the only one of the three leadership candidates who came out and backed Peter Murrell yeah. before he resigned. Looks bad for him. And uh, yeah. it does look as though he's inherited a total mess. And I think this could be the turning point for the SNP in Scotland. I think the Scottish people will now wake up mm. to what an awful shower they are and how appallingly they've run the country mm. while they've been in power. And this, I think, is the time w I think they're going to crumble now. Not good for the Tories, though, is it? It's not because particularly... they because Labour there's SM, Labour got one MP in the last general election. Yeah, and I think that I this mean that Labour to... are going to capture a lot of seats there. And Anas Sa Sawa has um, won leader. friends. He's the Labour leader. He's um, he's been very clever. He's met a lot of businessmen. 
um, had private conversations with them. He's demonstrating that he's pro-business, unlike Sturgeon and the SNP, who are anti-business, especially their own businesses. I mean, it's extraordinary. Um, no, I think Labour will make some real uh, ground, and Keir Starmer's right to keep going up there and supporting them, because... Um, the Conservatives, I'm afraid, will be a, a poor third again, if that. If mm. Peter Morell is found guilty of having used uh, funds inappropriately from the party, and it turns out that Nicola Sturgeon knew all about it, mm. what will that mean for her? Well, I mean, it's a good question. Um, you would have to think that she knew something about mm. it because she was the leader of the mm. party, OK, not the chief executive, but she was married to the chief executive and they did live together. Mm. And it is very hard for most people to believe that she didn't know what yeah. was going on. So that could be criminal when... charges for her. She could face criminal charges. I don't know about that. Um, mm. But, um, I mean, certainly her legacy now, I think, is... Tainted. ..is totally shattered. It's disastrous, isn't it? And I think that the true colours of the SNP, which is a murky, rather... Uh, infighting, nasty party uh, in the last few weeks has come mm. to the forefront. Yeah. Her legacy is poisonous now. Yes, absolutely. Piers Pottinger, great public affairs expert. Thanks for joining us. And great proud Scott, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> now, Easter holiday plans could be under threat for thousands of families using the Port of Dover this weekend. Not again. Of course, it comes with plans to slash the number of coaches on Good Friday. Ferry bosses are demanding that coach companies amend bookings and limit trip numbers from the Kent port amid fears that the site will be packed with people. Our national reporter Theo Chikomba joins us now live from Dover. Theo, uh, morning. The queues haven't started yet, but I guess they will be there quite soon. Yes, good morning. Well, it's the first day, particularly today, when me many people will be making their travel plans um, out of the UK and around the UK as well. Here at the port of Dover, uh, cars already here queuing up to get inside the port uh, and they've been here since the early hours of this morning. Last weekend uh, lots of people were stuck in traffic trying to get in. There were some logistical problems when it comes to processing and they were queuing all the way up to the top of the bridge which you can see just on my left shoulder but today uh, things are better. For the moment tomorrow could be busier. Uh, yesterday I spoke to a representative uh, from Network Rail and he was speaking about some of the engineering work works away from the port in and around the country and this is what he had to say. There's never a good time for closing the railway to improve it. At Easter it's one of the quieter times of the year so it's the best chance to do this work but I do apologise to everybody planning to travel this weekend and for those people who are planning on travelling please check with your train operating company before travelling to see if your journey is going to be disrupted. Well, travel expert Simon Calder joins us now. Good morning, Simon. Oh, it's always nice to see you. You are the absolute expert on these issues and I feel a sense of calm. But I know that if I was travelling somewhere tomorrow, that calm would very quickly disappear. How bad is it going to be for people? OK, well, look, shall we start on the railways? Because um, actually a lot of people are saying it is ridiculous that we have these uh, rail engineering works at exactly the time when people are wanting to travel. Because, of course, since COVID, um, the commuting business has collapsed, particularly actually on Mondays and Fridays. Um, but we are going to see wide scale engineering close downs. The most significant one, I think, affecting the highest number of people is that the West Coast main line uh, which serves Glasgow, Edinburgh, uh, Preston, Liverpool, Manchester, North uh, Wales, Birmingham and the West Midlands and the stretch the last 50 miles between Milton Keynes and Euston Station which we can see there closed completely on um, all the way through from Good Friday through to Easter Monday. Now, there are wonderful bus replacement services in place. Uh, trains will be starting and ending either in Keynes or in Rugby, from where you can catch a bus to Kettering and get a, a, a train from there. Um, and further north on the West Coast Main Line, there's huge amounts of work going on between Carlisle um, and Glasgow and Edinburgh. And so that's going to be causing problems actually all the way through till June. Um, other 
big projects include um, the part of London Victoria Station, which serves Brighton and Gatwick Airport. Um, that's going to be closed completely. There are parallel trains from London Bridge. And we're also seeing work, for example, between Tunbridge Wells and Hastings uh, in Kent and Sussex. Wherever you're going, as we heard from Thomas, you've really got to check in advance if you're trying to make a rail trip this, uh, this Easter. And of course, if you're trying to get to France, well, today, on the trains, it's madness. Um, Eurostar's cancelled two trains already between London and Paris uh, because of the French national strike there. And they say, you know, if you get to Paris, God, you know, your problems are really just beginning because of the uh, all the um, strike action affecting transport throughout France. Simon, we've had this sort of tradition, haven't we, in this country, that rail works are carried out during holiday weekends or when the kids are off school. I can't help but think that maybe we need to rethink that system because what happens at the moment now is people are able to work from home quite easily, much more easily post-pandemic, but what they can't do is travel and see their family from home. And I can't help but think that the passenger traffic must be more now in holiday times than it's ever been, and yet we're still being penalised with this old-fashioned system. Absolutely right. The numbers have completely bounced back at weekends, which gives mm. you a clue. This isn't people going to work. It's yeah. people um, going out and about, seeing friends, seeing family, um, going off um, on, on trips uh, within the UK. And certainly, uh, it, it's really odd that given that the railway, which is, of course, as we have talked about many times, in desperate states in terms of losing one-fifth of its uh, passenger numbers, they desperately get people back. And so what do they do? Well, they close everything down over Easter so that exactly the people they need to attract, um, people who are thinking, OK, well, I'll switch from um, uh, road to rail, um, just look at it and just think, well, I'm not going to bother with that. It looks um, an absolute mess. Uh, so, so, yes, it's something which actually has been talked about since the depths of the COVID uh, pandemic, when the railway industry was obviously an utter, utter uh, shambles in terms of money making, losing uh, well, a, a million pounds an hour for a lot of that time. And uh, there will be questions asked. And certainly by the time we get around to Christmas, um, I think a lot of people will be saying, hang on, is this the uh, sensible way to do this? And Simon, they, they, they're saying to coach, co coach companies to stay away from Dover. How can they can't compel coach companies, coach companies to stay away? If the coach companies have got bookings, are they going to turn up, aren't they? Well, I'm going to be... I, I was um, down in uh, Dover yesterday. In fact, I, I met Thomas there, which was a great treat. We were both up on the uh, uh, White Cliffs, and you can actually see them there behind that line of um, uh, trucks coming down the Jubilee Way into the port. And... Effectively, you've got an extraordinarily constrained site between the cliffs and the channel. Very little room to move. And we saw the results of that last weekend with all the coaches that got stuck. Now, I talked to the boss of the pool. He says we've got significantly fewer coaches going through. Tomorrow is going to be the real crunch day. Um, they've got extra facilities. They're putting up a marquee um, to act as a sort of second coach hall. Um, on top of that, they are going to be... Uh, getting more staff in and, as you say, spreading the uh, number of coaches through the weekend. Effectively, people who are booked to travel will be able to do so. They're just saying you can probably have a smoother journey if you can be flexible about uh, demand. I shall find out tomorrow because I have the immense joy of being booked on the nine o'clock bus from Victoria Coach Station in London to Brussels. Um, I don't know how much of Good Friday I will spend in Dover, but I hope it is just um, an hour or so. And what about flights, Simon? I'm off to walk the Catalonian coast next week. Will I get there OK? Yep. Are the flights going to be good? First of all, your choice of destination is impeccable. The oh, Catalan yes. coast, particularly um, just south of the uh, French French border, is um, a joy. Unfortunately, there's a clue there. You have to fly over France to get there. Um, French air traffic controllers have basically been on strike for about three weeks. Um, uh, British Airways, EasyJet, Ryanair cancelling flights today because they've really gone for a big walkout today. And unfortunately, because so many flights from 
from the UK go over France to get to Portugal, Spain, Italy, Switzerland, and so on. Um, it's an absolute mess. And British Airways cancelled 20 flights today. EasyJet have cancelled a few more. And that's that's mostly into France, but also, indeed, British Airways has cancelled uh, uh, a round trip from Heathrow to Barcelona because that goes over French airspace and okay. the, um, uh, they are on strike there. So, sorry. And if you are going to France, of course, once you touch down, your problems are only just beginning. Well, that's a cheerful note from Simon Corder <laughs> from The Independent. Happy to join, thanks for joining us. Piers Potter, you're still with us. Piers, are you planning a nice Easter getaway with your lovely wife, Karen? Well, I was until I heard Simon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I'm going to uh, Somerset for the weekend, but next week I'm going to Sicily, mm. um, which I'm very fond of. But, uh, they're, they're, of course, we then fly over France. France. So um, mm. I just keep my fingers crossed. Those strikes in France are crippling. Well, the French love strike. All about the pension, they? of course, because they want to raise the pension from 62 to 64. Well, God help us. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to work till at least 67. Absolutely. I know. <laughs> That's next year, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but when it's Dev's turn, it'll be 80. <laughs> Maybe they're changing the pension rules. Uh, right. Thank you, Simon, uh, as well. Thank you, Simon Calder, this morning. Um, that's a bit depressing, isn't it? Boss Certainly replacement is. service. Three words that make your blood run cold, aren't Now, they? Rishi Sunak is defending that plan to house up to 500 asylum seekers in a barge in Portland Harbour in Dorset, calling it fair. And remember, we talked to the local MP yesterday. Hadn't even... The first thing he knew about it was when he read about it in the newspapers and heard it, of course, on GB News. Well, it's part of the government's strategy to end the controversial practice of housing asylum seekers in hotel accommodation, which is currently costing us, the taxpayer, up to £7 million a day. Let's talk to our GB News political reporter, Olivia Attlee, who joins us from the Home Office this morning. Good morning, Olivia. Um, there's only going to be 500 people on this uh, flotel, as, as they're calling it. Isn't it just a little bit of kind of headline-grabbing clickbait that isn't going to make any difference whatsoever? Well, it does feel a little bit like a drop in the ocean, but Suella Braverman is absolutely determined to end this practice of housing migrants in hotels, which, as you say, is costing the taxpayer up to £7 million a day. As well as it only being 500 migrants, there are a couple of other problems too, one of which is the council in Dorset and actually the Conservative MP, Richard Drax, are very, very concerned about the idea of having a barge full of migrants in their town. They're worried about the effect it'll have on the local community. It's a popular seaside resort. And so the government has promised to pay the council up to £3,500 per day per migrant in order to sort of sweeten the pill, as it were. Well, if the government's plan is to cut costs, the, the, the headline figures are that it costs about £150 per day to put up a migrant in a hotel. This will cost £50 a day. Add another £3,500 onto it, and it's not looking like such a uh, value-for-money solution. Now, the government is in talks. You say it's only 500, and you're quite right, but the government is in talks to, to do another one of, of sort of 2,000 migrants in a different location, but with a lot of problems besetting this one, there's a bit of an issue there. Isn't there, Olivia? Thank you. You'd have thought, Bev, wouldn't you, that the rich, local MP Richard Traps would have been the Home Secretary would have talked to him about this plan. Yes. First thing about it was when he read it in the media. We talked to him yeah, yesterday. Yeah, it's outrageous. And isn't they, it? they didn't even know about the three thousand pounds where it was going. Awful. Per migrant. It's, it's such a mess. We want the stop the boats policy to work, Home Secretary and Prime Minister. But for God's sake, take the country with you on it. Totally. Right. Still to come. We're going to give you more updates on this Tory MP who offered to leak confidential policy documents to uh, gambling industry investors and lots, lots more. This is The Point on GB News, Britain's news channel. Hello there, I'm Greg Dewhurst. Welcome to your latest broadcast from the Met Office. We see some heavy showers across the UK through the day ahead. There will be some sunny spells over the next few days, temperatures on the rise. So low pressure in charge of our weather at the moment, but this starts to slip away into Good Friday and the Easter weekend, and it allows high pressure to build and settle things down generally. However, weather fronts will try and move in, particularly as we get to Monday. So heavy showers already from the word go this morning across northern parts of England, across into Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, generally dry start with some sunny spells. But as we move through the day, increasing risk of some heavy thundery showers across parts of Wales, the Midlands, central southern England. Elsewhere, we'll generally see sunny spells. Rain holding on, though, across Shetland and Orkney as we move into the afternoon. In any sunny spells, we should see highs of around 15 or 16 Celsius, so feeling a little warmer than it did on Wednesday. Into the evening time, we could see those showers merge into some longer spells of rain, particularly down eastern parts of England. But elsewhere, we'll see clearing skies, and that will allow temperatures to drop away as we head overnight. Temperatures 
parts of Northern Ireland, Scotland falling close to, if not below freezing, leading to a patchy frost here, just holding up across the far southeast where we have thicker cloud and some patchy rain. So it's a chilly start to Friday morning, but plenty of blue skies, with the, with the exception being just the east coast of England and also far northeast of Scotland. Here we could see some low cloud lingering through the day, perhaps thick enough for the odd spot of light rain or drizzle. So feeling quite cool here, but elsewhere in the sunshine into the afternoon, a warm feeling day, 16 or 17 Celsius in that sunshine, making it feel pretty pleasant for the time of year. This warm, dry weather holds on through Saturday and into Sunday, plenty of sunshine, but it does turn cooler and more unsettled as we head into Easter Monday. Those temperatures just dropping a little to around average for the time of year. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are, <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing, go on. He's probably gonna want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubry, weekday evenings at six o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. <laughs> We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess I've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Good morning and welcome to The Point on GB News with me, Andrew Pearce and Pep Turner. 
still to come this morning. Front page of today's Times, a Conservative MP breaking rules on lobbying to help out the gambling industry. He's in big trouble. The MP for Blackpool was filmed, but one of our very own GB News presenters dodged that very same sting. We'll tell you all about it and talk to the person in question. Indeed, somebody has a bit of common sense. And the Prime Minister is defending that plan to house migrants in a barge off the Dorset coast, even though it's been opposed by the local Tory MP. Do you think it should be, they should be housed there? Also, hundreds of police officers are expected to be removed from the Met Police as Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley admits in a damning letter that there are officers who just shouldn't be in the force. Do you think the Met is able to investigate and reform itself? And in Dover, they're building temporary marquees because they're expecting even more travel chaos this weekend. Of course they are. It's Easter. We'll be talking about the great Easter travel getaway. Plus, we've got Carol Malone uh, going to be in the studio uh, and also Joanna Williams, two of our favourites. But first of all, here are your news headlines with Rihanna. Thank you, Bev. Good morning. It's one minute past ten. Your top stories from the GB newsroom. Counter-terrorism officers, along with those who tackle serious organised crime, have been drafted in to help clean up the Met Police workforce. Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley believes there are hundreds of corrupt officers who shouldn't be in the job and he wants to weed them out. Of more than 1,000 cases, nearly 700 will be reassessed, with almost 200 referred to formal risk management or vetting. Figures also reveal 161 serving Met officers have criminal convictions. Former Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has pulled out of a climate change event this evening after her husband was released from custody without charge. The home of Ms Sturgeon and the former SNP chief executive remains cordoned off pending further investigation. Peter Murrell was arrested as part of a probe into SNP finances, including £600,000 set aside for Scotland's independence campaign. Ms Sturgeon insists she had no prior knowledge of police plans or intentions ahead of her resignation in February. Sir Keir Starmer has promised to introduce specialist rape courts if Labour wins the next election. It comes amid a record backlog in the courts, which sees victims face an average three-year wait for justice. Government analysis shows the number of rape survivors dropping their cases has more than doubled since 2015. Sir Keir has described the state of the justice system under the Conservatives as a national scandal. New research has found more than 45,000 burglaries reported last year were unattended by police in England. Data obtained by the Lib Dems shows more than 120 break-ins a day took place without an officer visiting the scene. 75% of cases were found to be closed without identifying a suspect. The parties refer to it as a postcode lottery and is calling for officers to be legally required to visit victims. Drivers face major travel disruption over the Easter weekend with up to 17 million cars predicted to hit the road. Research by the RAC shows 2.7 million car journeys are expected on both Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Rail engineering work, including the closure of London Euston Station all weekend, will make the roads even busier. Travel expert Simon Calder told us it's the wrong time to be carrying out railworks. It's really odd that... Given that the airway, which is, of course, as we have talked about many times, in desperate states in terms of losing one-fifth of its uh, passenger numbers, they desperately would get people back. And so what do they do? Well, they close everything down over Easter so that exactly the people they need to attract, um, people who are thinking, OK, well, I'll switch from um, uh, road to rail, um, just look at it and just think, well, I'm not going to bother with that. It looks um, an absolute mess. The government's approved a £48 million fund to make England's most dangerous roads safer. The money will go towards improving signage and road markings, as well as reducing congestion and emissions. Allocations of which roads will receive the funding are based on data by the Road Safety Foundation on the number of people killed and traffic levels. Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Roads and Local Transport, Richard Holden, told us they're trying to tackle the 27 worst roads around the country. 
This money is going to really help save lives as well. Uh, we estimate around 750 uh, fatalities or serious injuries will be prevented over the next 20 years uh, by this investment. Alongside uh, driver behaviour, actually some of these junctions and these road surfaces um, are some of the major issues we see uh, when we're uh, trying to tackle uh, issues around road safety in the country. Millions of mobile phones across the UK will sound an alarm this month in a new test to warn the public of danger. The alert systems intended for use in life-threatening situations, including flooding and wildfires. The message will come through at 3pm on the 23rd of April and will also vibrate for up to 10 seconds. The test, scheduled for St George's Day, clashes with major events, including the London Marathon and Premier League matches. Hundreds of patients with breast and prostate cancer could benefit from a new drug. The NHS-approved tablet, Olaparib, prevents cancerous cells from repairing their DNA, causing them to die. Men with advanced prostate cancer and women with early breast cancer at high risk of the disease returning will be able to access it through NHS England. The Institute of Cancer Research has called the decision life-changing, saying the medicine gives patients a chance to live longer and healthier lives. And the US president has accepted an invite from the king for a state visit to the UK. The White House says Joe Biden had a very friendly chat with the king over the phone. The president's due to visit Northern Ireland and the Republic next week, but won't attend the coronation in May. He'll be represented instead by his wife, Jill. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. It's back to Andrew and Beth. Before, I'm just very intrigued by this door in the front of the eye, Right. No it? new smart motorways because of the, the fact that they're, they're dangerous, they're damaging. Uh, up to nine people died on smart motorways. These were the brilliant idea of the government yeah. who thought, let's get rid of the hard shoulder so the traffic can move, smooth, move more slowly, can move more quickly. And what yeah. happened? People who were broke down no longer on a hard shoulder, mm. was struck by the car. So, finally... I'm so pleased. So it is a bit of good news. Yeah, it's good there news. Is, there is. Maybe we'll discuss this when we have Carol Malone and Joanna Williams in the studio They're with like us strong this morning. Groups. We're also talking about the Metropolitan Police. So, 200 police officers with past accusations of sex crimes or domestic abuse need an urgent risk assessment, says the Commissioner. Why are they still police officers? You kind of have to read that twice to think, yeah. is that true? They're all still police officers and they're going to be reviewed, even though they've, they've all these misdemeanours on their on Incredible. Their watch. So, the already on defiance Fire Force continues its blitz to change its culture. Hundreds more officers and staff are having old allegations re-examined. Our reporter Paul Haw Hawkins, he's at Scotland Yard and can tell us more. Paul. Yeah, morning, Andrew. Morning, Bev. So this follows on from the Casey report, follows on from the David Carrick. Uh, issue also uh, Wayne Cousins etc. Uh, uh, the Casey report uh, saying that the Met Police was institutionally racist, homophobic, misogynistic and then you remember back in January Mark Rowley the boss of the Met Police then launching this investigation over a thousand people investigated uh, previously investigated for uh, domestic violence and sexual abuse they are being reinvestigated he now says that four in five of uh, more than 1,000 cases now need to be reassessed or uh, reinvestigated. And in fact, 90 officers have been moved from fighting uh, serious and organised crime to the Met's professional standards team. So this, so this is part of an update from Mark Rowley writing to the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, writing to the Home Secretary, Suella Bravman. Let's just uh, go through some of these statistics that he's updated in his letter then. So 1,131 individuals have been reinvestigated. 246 will face no formal action because correct action was taken at the time. 689 will undergo a new assessment to pursue new or missing lines of inquiry, including possibly talking again to victims of witnesses. Uh, 196 face formal risk management measures and potentially a review to determine if they should remain in the force. Now, he also mentioned in his letter that 161 Met officers have criminal convictions. Of these, 76 for serious traffic offences such as uh, drink driving, 49 are for dishonesty or violence, 8 committed the offences while they were serving in the Met, 3 have convictions 
for sexual offences. Now, uh, Mark Rowley also said that the force is going through all 50,000 of its staff. It's been through uh, 10,000 of them already, checking them against the police national database. Uh, uh, and of those 10,000, 38 potential cases of misconduct, 55 cases of off-duty association with a criminal. He's saying in the next six months, up to 100 officers may have to leave the organisation. It could be hundreds over the next uh, two to three years. And he's considering banning anyone with convictions other than the most minor from the force. Of course, all of this designed to uh, uh, reinstill trust, uh, public trust, in the Metropolitan Police. It, of course, police in this country, they police by consent, they need that trust. And in fact, a BBC YouGov survey uh, out today says that, uh, uh, that almost half of women totally distrusted the Met. So all of this designed to reinstill public confidence, public trust in the Metropolitan uh, Police. But listening to the chairman of uh, London's Police and Crime Committee, Susan Hall, this morning, she was commenting on Sir Mark's findings. She said that uh, things are going to get much worse before they get better. Paul, Bev and I are shaking our head in disbelief to hear that three police officers with convictions for sexual offences are still serving police officers. How come? Yeah, well, that's, that's part of this review. You know, uh, that Mark, uh, Mark Rowley has said that not only are they going to uh, weed these people out of the force, and it is going to take a long time. You're going to keep hearing these stories trickling through in the news about officers that, have been, uh, uh, that, are, that are being uh, forced out of the Met. But they're also uh, tightening up the vetting procedure, so these kind of people don't end up serving in the Met again. It's all, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to get a lot more difficult for the Met before it gets better. And this is all part of reinvigorating trust. And Mark Rowley's been very open about it, saying that, look, I've had to move police from fighting terrorism and serious organised crime into this uh, director of professional standards to try and clean up the Met, because there's no point in trying to fight crime if the public don't don't have trust in us, don't have confidence in us to do it in the first place. So clean up the Met first and then they can fight organised crime better. And don't forget, the, the Met Police relies on the public as well to supply them with information to help them keep the public safe in the first place. OK, thank you, Paul. Paul Hawkins said, do you know what I'm also thinking? Do you know who's going to make a fortune out of this? The employment lawyers. Because right now, if you are one of these police mm. officers and you said, well, it was dealt with at the time, right. I've kept my job, now you're going to get the sack. That doesn't fill us with confidence either. And they're taking, they've removed 100 police officers from the front line in the war against terror. Yeah. Really important. To deal with to this. To deal with this. Oh. It is a flipping shambles, isn't it? It's a shambles. No wonder women in particular don't trust the police officers to learn that three police officers have got convictions for sexual offences and they're still wearing the uniform. 1,131 still in there with, with some sort of conviction. But it also... It was, why wasn't it... Why weren't these dealt with properly at the time? Anyway, no doubt that will not be the last we hear about that. Uh, so, moving on, Conservative MP Scott Benton. You may not have heard of him, but he's been incredibly naughty. He's had the party whip suspended. That means he can't actually represent the party anymore. He's not, been, he's not lost his job no, yet, he's has still he? an MP. He still gets his pay of £84,000, but he's has to operate as effectively as an independent. That's right. So he was filmed offering to help the gambling industry in exchange for financial reward. It was an undercover sting by the Times. It revealed Benton, who's the MP for Blackpool South, was ready to leak market sense of information to an investment fund involved in the gambling industry and ask parliamentary questions on behalf on their behalf in breach of parliamentary rules, effectively asking cash yeah. for questions. Earlier we spoke to Tory MP Richard Holden, who had this to say. I think it's quite right that it's been referred to the Parliamentary Commission of Standards. The government toughened the rules uh, not that long ago to say that people couldn't do paid lobbying uh, for companies. And furthermore, um, he's also the chief whip, uh, suspended the whip uh, from uh, Mr Benton yesterday. And uh, one of the things we've been putting pressure on over the last few years is for a proper review of the 2005 Gambling Act, which was passed by the last Labour government, because one of the things which wasn't looked at or really understood at the time was issues uh, around uh, online gambling. Uh, this one uh, is, is very serious, and that's why the, uh, that's why the party has moved very swiftly to suspend the whip uh, and also has been referred to the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards. I think that's exactly what was the right thing to do. So with us this morning is Head of Digital News at GB News, Dan Falvey. Good morning, Dan. Now, oddly, this story has also ended up at our door. Why? It certainly has. So when The Times did this investigation, Scott Benton wasn't the only Conservative MP they approached. They also approached GB News' own uh, Philip Davies and... He looked into this and thought the whole thing seemed a bit fishy. So 
he teamed up with GB News Investigates uh, reporter Charlie Peters, and they actually went to try and sting the sting. Uh -huh. They went undercover <laughs> themselves as they went to this event and basically said, look, we're not going to do anything improper here, we're not interested. Mm. But I think what was interesting about this is what really came out of it was that when Phil Davies asked uh, the undercover Times reporters, have you been speaking to other MPs? And said, we've spoken to several other MPs. So I think this is a story to watch this space. Let's see where it goes. Is Scott Benton the only one here? Mm. Right. Or given that what we uncovered in that uh, undercover filming, could there be more stories that come in the days ahead? Mm. Fascinating. Do you think they only talked to Tory MPs? As part of the sting? Well, it's... Government party? It's interesting because it was Tory MPs got done just a few weeks ago as led well, by when led by donkeys, a yeah. left-wing organisation went to very Fuzzy much Quartan. targeting yeah. Conservative MPs. And I think there will be, you know, plenty of our viewers asking, why is it Conservative MPs who keep getting put in this position? They are the governing party, but, you know, we've got a Labour party that, you know, looks like it could be the next government and they could also be... And, you, you know, know Dan, mm. in the dying months, embers of the last Labour government, three former Labour cabinet ministers were stung in exactly the same way. Uh, Patricia Hewitt... Jack Straw and uh, Jeff Hoon, def former Defence Secretary, none of them got the peerages they thought they would be entitled to because they were cabinet ministers and they all fell for it. Film saying, oh, I can put the questions in if you pay me a certain amount of money. Uh, and perhaps this is what's going on here. Tory MPs thinking we're coming to the end of the road. They've been yeah. in power for a long time. This bloke's going to lose his seat anyway. Won it for the first time in 2019. So he's green as well as stupid. Well, I think one thing that, you know, Labour Party should be careful of is they, they've been out saying, you know, this is absolutely yeah. uh, disgraceful, etc. But their own MPs could be doing this that they don't know about. Exactly. And that is not to question the integrity of the Labour Party leadership, but it is to question what some of their own backbenchers may be doing. So, got to be a bit careful when they start, you know, mm -hmm. slinging the mud in one direction, because they may mm -hmm. find mud on their face as well. Are we going to see this film with Phil Davis at some point? We, uh, there is a package that is available on our YouTube and on our website, um, and I'm sure we'll be playing it through the day. Right, and I'm sure Phil will be talking about it when he's on air with Esther at this time tomorrow with his missus uh, on... GB News. I Thank think you he's going to speak to us too. Oh, we got him as well. He's going to give us a sneak Excellent. preview. So well done, Phil. Just shows not all MPs are led by their nose and greed. Absolutely. Because that's what it's about. Yeah, absolutely. Great not all of them. No. Well, quite a lot of them. You do get the impression that they are just filling suitcases with cash at the moment, aren't you, before they run out into the horizon? Exactly. Anyway, right, still to come, the average house price in the UK has increased yet again. That's right, we'll tell you uh, by what amount. This is GB News, uh, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything, I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things, we've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate okay, Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years, I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Day. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Ten twenty one. You're with us at the point on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. So, average UK house prices have risen for the third month in a row. On an annual basis, house prices were one point six percent higher than a year ago, slowing from two point one percent in February. But what does this all actually mean for you and your finances? Joining us is our very own economics and business editor Liam Halligan, as well as the independent North London Estates Agency owner Jeremy Leaf. Good morning, morning uh, you both. to you both. Um, Liam, we keep waiting for this house market crash that everyone's talking about. It's not coming, I suppose. Well, that is good news. Well, it depends. If you're a house owner, of mm. course, it's good news. If you're somebody trying to get on the housing ladder or your kid's trying to buy a house, it's so difficult these days. A lot of people are actually waiting for a house yeah. price crash. It is the third rise in a row. House prices are now 1.6% uh, higher percent higher than they were in March 2022. The average house is £287,880 compared to £285,660 in February. And I think what's going on here is that the housing market is being kept buoyant by the, the fundamental undersupply of houses in this country, which I've talked and written about a lot over the years. But also what's happening, even though the Bank of England is raising interest rates and there may be another increase to come, they're currently at 4.25%, of course, we've had 11 rises in a row, mortgage rates are actually coming down. Yeah. During the mini-budget, all the aftermath, the market turmoil, mortgage rates, the average mortgage rate mm. on a two-year fix was up above 6%. Mm. Because the money markets have calmed down, because there's a bit more political stability, because international investors aren't questioning the UK's solvency going forward, uh, an average two-year fix is down below 5% from above 6%. That's happened in recent months. It's quite hard to get your head around. Mm. And because people think that the Bank of England will stop raising interest rates soon, and interest rates may even come down, we had an MPC member last night talking about that, one of the economists from the Bank of England saying that she thinks interest rates may come start coming down quicker than we think. So the long end of the curve, if you like, to use economist jargon, where the mortgage suppliers buy the money to then lend us the money, the money's a bit cheaper. And that lower mortgage cost compared to where people thought it would be a few months ago, that's keeping house prices buoyant. Let's bring Jeremy Leith into conversation. Jeremy, you've been an estate agent more than 30 years. You're a very thriving business, particularly in North London. I keep reading house prices going down, and then we get the official figures saying, they're not, they're going up. What, what's going on here? We get this all the time. Right. You see the journalists often pick up on the negative side of the story, whereas we're at the sharp end, we're on the high street, we're seeing buyers and sellers making decisions based on the figures that Liam's talking about. And actually, the mood out there is much more confident than it was maybe three months ago. I mean, after the mini-budget, it felt like someone had pulled the phones out. It was just awful. Really? Yeah. And, and, and it, 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 will the fact that mortgage rates coming down, if they're about to start, that's going to have an even... I don't think people really look at it on a day-to-day -day basis. They look at it on a longer-term basis. It's, it's all about confidence, how mm. you feel about it. And there's always people who want to move. And all that crazy activity a year or so ago when people actually couldn't buy, there were five or six or more people competing for the same properties. Those people that need to move hasn't gone away. So they're slowly coming back out there, tempted by, as Liam what says, about, you know, the lower rates. Are you getting first-time buyers or can they still not yeah, afford it? Yes, starting to come out. Actually, are the they? key, we want to see people not renting as long as they are and being tempted to come and buy, mm. which would release properties for renting and keep rents in check. I was chatting to the mortgage broker yesterday, actually, mm. funnily enough. As you know, we, we've talked about my mortgage is up for renewal, so I've been looking at what my options are. It's very difficult in this position at the moment because mine literally quadrupled overnight. Yeah. 
The mortgage advisor I was chatting to yesterday, he said he's hearing that people are still meeting their mortgage repayments. They're still looking to get either remortgage or buy a new house. What they are doing is not spending as much money elsewhere in their life because they say the mortgage is the one thing that they can't afford to default on. So they won't have eat out, they won't go on holidays, they won't buy a new car. That's the effect of all this, isn't it, as well on the economy? Yeah, for a lot of households, mortgage or rent uh, is obviously the biggest chunk yeah. of your income. For many young people, it's half their income just goes... Mm. Part, half their post tax income, bang, even more. Yeah. It's just gone. And, of course, that's going to affect their ability as consumers more generally. You know, here on GB News yesterday, I was saying, because there's, a, there's, there's at the moment, there's an emerging oversupply of cars globally... <laughs> Lockdown happened, the supply chain issues happened, they're now being solved. There's like a surge of production in cars and there's not enough demand to meet the number of cars mm. that are being produced. So car prices are actually starting to come down now, new car prices. So if you want to buy a car, hold your horses because right. I think there's going to be a lot of price competition. If you want to buy a house, I would say, obviously we've got Jeremy in, 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 in the room, I'd take my life in my hands, but I would say <laughs> don't hang around waiting for a house price crash mm. because I just don't think it's going to happen. And a lot of young people will berate me for saying that, but I just think that's the fundamental reality because there's such a structural yeah. undersupply yeah. of homes in this country to either rent or buy. It, well, that's the key to it your ears, isn't it? Stay uh, age and go out absolutely. and buy, says Liam But the key Halligan. to it, actually, what, what Liam has said and what you touched on before there, Andrew, is first-time buyers. The yeah. first-time buyers are the lifeblood of the market. Yeah. We want them to buy at the bottom or lower levels and trade up, not the investors at the lower level. And that's so much more healthy for the market. I was 19 when I bought my first house. Mm. It cost... £17,000. Mm. You wouldn't get a garage for that now. It's a night yeah. out for you these days. <laughs> <laughs> you say, the Tuesday. Nicest thing. Tuesday. <laughs> Tick of your peg. Tick of your peg. <laughs> but, but these days, what average age is a first-time buyer? Jeremy? Well, they're over, well, usually over 30, yeah, unless they've got the help with Bank of Mum and Dad. Otherwise, yeah. they're stuck. Is mm. Bank of Mum and Dad really important here? Absolutely. Massive. It's paramount. One of, one of Can't the best without of, it, most people. of course, is that there's no stamp duty if you're a first-time yeah. buyer. Well, Is up there? to a certain limit. Some up, stamp duty, uh, some first-time buyers can afford can afford a lot. But stamp duty, of course, is a factor. But does it kick in? What level? It's it's more about raising the deposits. Actually, yeah. that's yeah. what we hear on, uh, all the time. It's raising deposits, mm. and unfortunately, it had this help to buy scheme, which was more about help to sell for the builders. If they Absolutely. could replace it with something which was more helping the the buyers, the first-time mm -hmm. buyers, are really aimed at that because they are so paramount for the market, and we get them off renting, which will release properties, you know, for, for renting, which would keep the deposits saving and, and, in check. And they're yeah. making it very difficult for people to rent homes, Liam, landlords, because landlords have been demonised, and yet most landlords own one property. Yeah, I mean, there so are not, obviously they're not, they're institutional... They're not all Peter Rackman, are yeah, they? There are, there are all, obviously institutional landlords who who really screw their tenants yeah. to the floor, but as you say, a lot, of, a lot of homes are rented out by accidental landlords. Couples who have done OK, yeah. they've kept a house, moved out of the house, but kept it to rent. They, they own one at most two properties. Uh, and I do think the government's making it very difficult for landlords. Even good landlords are getting penalised because there are some nasty landlords out there. And tenants are getting really aggressive about trying to sue landlords, certainly in the, in the London market. I just wanted to touch on Bank of Mum and Dad. In my book, Home Truths, uh, I unearthed... That's a good plug, Liam. I, I, I unearthed... You've got to take your chances <laughs> when you get them. Uh, I, I unearthed some figures that the Bank of Mum and Dad, and these were from 2018, uh, the Bank of Mum and Dad was involved in a, over half of you first-time buyer house really? purchases, and in London and the South East, it's two-thirds. Yeah. And that touches on something really important. When you bought your first house, Andrew, you were a first-generation homeowner. I was a first-generation yeah, homeowner. It's <clears throat> absolutely massive. A piece of social mobility that mm. people like you and I, yeah. from the backgrounds we're from, up in a council could, house. could buy our own yeah. homes. The housing market back then was a source of social mobility and progress. The housing market now is a form of social divisiveness and rancour because so many people cannot get on the housing ladder, so they're going to spend their whole lives paying rent and they're going to have to be paying rent, or the state's going to have to be paying rent when they're. Pensioners, this is an absolute disaster, the fact that home ownership is falling so sharply in this country. And whichever political party solves this will win a general election and will deserve to. I, but I almost wonder whether the youngsters don't care. 
I know that seems like a radical thing to do, but as the mother of a, of a teenage boy, there is a whole generation of, of those youngsters, they just presume they're going to rent well, forever. They almost don't want the responsibility, like a European mindset, more of a kind of rental Yeah, we culture. do hear that because, of course, a lot of people from Europe are, uh, are living and working here. But our, our mindset and what we are hearing is that people who are renting would rather pay their mortgage than the landlord's yes. mortgage. Yeah, yes. So that's Obvious. what they want to do. Absolutely. So they want to do it, and that is the way to do it, is to help the first-time buyers get the people off renting, release the properties renting. That's not the only solution. Mm. You know, solution. We've got a massive housing crisis in this country, yeah. but that would be a start. Yeah, mm. yeah, I agree. Um, are you seeing much, either of you, about this, this idea, it's particularly happening in America, where big banks are buying up whole absolutely. swathes of houses? Absolutely. Because there will be a rental culture. Uh, 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 20, 30, you'll own nothing, you'll be Happy. There are more and more institutional landlords and they're further and further away from the actual tenants. That's why tenants are getting more and more aggressive yeah. about uh, in their relationship with their landlords because their landlords are some kind of offshore corporation. It's happening here in the yeah. UK, not just in London, uh, in Manchester and the North East too. It's definitely happening in, in Dublin where I have yeah. lots of family. The housing market in Dublin is even tighter than it is here, the lack of accommodation mm -hmm. for young people is even worse than it is here, and a lot of institutions are buying up those the, the, that property mm -hmm. because financial markets are so unstable. If they put their money into long-term bonds, the return is less than the rate of inflation. So they want to put money in yeah. bricks because they know people have to live somewhere. Yeah. Remember Margaret Thatcher's property owning democracy, Jeremy? Those were the days, weren't they? Well, it was good for the market, but actually responsible agents don't like to see boom and bust. We like to see people coming in and out of the market freely and transactions happening. That's yeah. much better. And actually we're approaching that type of market now with supply and dem demand much more okay. balanced. He's Gentlemen, a nice estate agent. Thank you both so <laughs> like much. Nice right, still agents. to come, the UK I'll is set uh, to launch a phone-based national alert network. We're going to be finding out about that. It makes my blood boil. After your morning's news with Rhiannon Jones. Good morning. It's 10.32, your top stories from the GB Newsroom. Counter-terrorism officers, along with those who tackle serious organised crime, have been drafted in to help clean up the Met Police workforce. Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley believes there are hundreds of corrupt officers who shouldn't be in the job and he wants to weed them out. Of more than 1,000 cases, nearly 700 will be reassessed, with almost 200 referred to formal risk management or vetting. Former Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has pulled out of a climate change event this evening after her husband was released from custody without charge. The home of Miss Sturgeon and the former SNP chief executive remains cordoned off pending further investigation. Peter Murrell was arrested as part of a probe into SNP finances, including £600,000 set aside for Scotland's independence campaign. In breaking news, a 23-year-old man has pleaded not guilty at Liverpool Crown Court to the murder of beautician L. Edwards in Merseyside. Connor Chapman is also charged with possessing a submachine gun with intent to endanger life. 26-year-old Miss Edwards was shot dead in the Lighthouse pub in Wirral just before midnight on Christmas Eve. Sir Keir Starmer has promised to introduce specialist rape courts if Labour wins the next election. It comes amid a record backlog in the courts, which sees victims face an average three-year wait for justice. Government analysis shows the number of rape survivors dropping their cases has more than doubled since 2015. And the US president has accepted an invite from the king for a state visit to the UK. The White House says Joe Biden had a very friendly chat with King Charles over the phone. The president's due to visit Northern Ireland and the Republic next week, but won't attend the coronation in May. He'll be represented instead by his wife, Jill. TV online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn, this is GB News. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment.
Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2469 and €1.1438. Euros. The price of gold is £1,619.13 per ounce and the FTSE 100 set 7,701 points. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News, investments that matter. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. You are watching To The Point on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. Here's Natter in again. It's Carol Malone. She comes in. She thinks it's her programme. She Carol, comes in We're going to come to away. Carol and Joanna in just a moment. But first of all, emergency. I feel like I need to set off a siren in this studio sometimes, to be honest, to get everyone's attention. Uh, sirens are going to go off on every smartphone in the country the government has announced as part of a test for its new emergency alerts system. And it's going to be done on 3pm on Sunday the 23rd of April, St George's Day. Is that significant? I wonder. The sound of vibration is going to be a taste of this controversial new system that none of us want. Damn right it's controversial. Well, to discuss this in more detail, we're joined by Alex Woodman from the National Fire Chiefs Council. Good morning, Alex. Are you going to defend this system? If so, go for it, because I'm going to be quite a tough audience. Good morning. Yes, I certainly am. This is a, a new system, as you just said. The test will go live on the 23rd at 3pm. And this is about us having the ability to warn and inform the public of any incidents related to things like flood and wildfires. So for us, this is a positive addition to the tools that are available to us in emergencies. I, I've, I've lived in this country all my life and I can honestly say that I've never been the victim of a wildfire and I don't think I know anybody that has been a victim of a wildfire. And if there is a fire, and I'm not saying they don't happen, but human beings have these senses called smell <laughs> and also 
heat alert awareness. So I don't need the phone to beep to tell me to run if there's a fire in my area. So I think as we saw last summer, there were some significant wildfires all over the country. We had about 50 in one day. We had up to 800 firefighters deployed fighting them. So I think last summer was a good example of where this system would have been useful to us. And as you said, yes, of course, people have their, their senses and their awareness. This is an additional measure to help us if you take things like flooding incidents, the ability for us to share information in that local area at speed would be a really critical asset to us. So I think we have seen examples of where the system would be useful to us. Alex, how many people died because they didn't get a beep on their phone? So last year, fortunately, nobody died in the UK as a result of those wildfires. And I think I put that down to the efforts of the firefighters, the crews and the command teams that went out to support the communities in that time. And that was also support from our communities. This is about an additional tool available to us. I don't have a phone, mobile phone. So there are a number of individuals that we know who don't have mobile phones, but this is about an additional measure. So most people but have what access about to them, somebody... How do, how do they get helped? So this is an additional measure. So what we won't be doing is just using this as a tool alone. So if there's operational reasons, we can deploy crews still. This will not take away from our operational capabilities. This is an enhanced measure that will capture the majority of people. And we have had some successful pilots and tests where we've seen this work. Where does it come from, this idea? Is it you guys or is it some white, uh, brain, brainchild of somebody in government? No, it's, this has been designed in consultation with emergency services and other partners. This is led by government. We've seen this work in other countries across the world. The United States, Canada, Japan have similar systems. This is a measure to get information out in a targeted way to the community if there is a risk to life. Alex, this idea that we should all be walking around worried about dropping dead because of a fire or an alert. It's a problem. It is causing people stress, depression, mental health attitudes, uh, issues because of this attitude that we always have to be risk averse. For years, we've had amazing men and women like you that keep us safe and come to our aid when we need them. We do not need the government to hacking into our phone because whether you like it or not, this is going to happen on your phone, isn't it? Unless you take measures to turn it off, the government has already accessed our phone to make this happen. We need some pushback. I don't think the public want this, Alex. So we've seen very positive responses in the pilot phases. Up to 88% of people responded positively. 85% wanted this on their phones. I think the term of saying this is hacking on technology. This is about having phones across that have 4G, 5G system. This sits in a standard mobile phone device. This is not utilising something that is secondary within the phone. This is just a capability that it has. My ask of individuals would be that they would leave this system on. You can turn it off if you want to. And this is about us getting messages out to the community as quickly and effectively as we can if there is a risk to life. The media do that, and the media have done that since the beginning of time in this country, not quite the beginning of time, but in recent years. The media are brilliant at that. We have systems in place. We have great social media now. Somebody will tell me something on Twitter much more quickly than the government or our beloved fire service can possibly do. We just don't need it. It's going to cost money. It's going to cause problems. So we respect the fact and that the media is, as we know, an, an excellent tool for getting information out. This is not any different, though. This is something that will be coming direct from government or direct from emergency services. There are protocols in place about how we would use this. My hope is, is that this will be a trusted source of rapid information that we can utilise as decision-making commanders in the event of an emergency situation that shows a risk to life. And as I've said, predominantly this will be around flooding. This will be about wildfires. The technology allows us to either cover a large area or really hone into a local ward level. And this is about adding additional messaging in crisis. All right, that's Alex Woodman from the National Fighters Council. Let's ask Thank our paper Alex. reviewers. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> Bev's got a beer in her bonnet about oh, that, I as have. you can tell. <laughs> Joanna Williams, author and academic, is with us. Carol Malone, broadcast. She was one who was clattering in as I you were making clattering. a lot of noise. You were talking. And Malone, to me. what do you think about this idea? 
Well, Bev's not sold on it. <laughs> she was a bit no, lost I've barely begun. And also, look at the class action. Sorry, Carol, go no, on. No, no, you're, you're completely right. It really hacks me off that, that, that they can hack into our phone. I mean, you know, I'm not very good on apps and, and messages anyway. I would probably You're not as bad as me. Because I'd have it on silent. Well, well, you, you, yeah. you won't have it. It doesn't matter. It's going to go it off whether you like it or not. Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. It's a complete imposition. And what it means is, and as you quite rightly pointed out, it means they can spy on us even more than they yeah. already yeah. do, which I think is quite scary. And, and he didn't convince me there. You, yeah. you went 40 times round the block and he wasn't doing it. No, I don't want it either. And you say, we can smell a fire and, and we'll yeah. hear it on Twitter. And we're not idiots. Here's the thing. Joanna, News flash. we're not idiots. Are you an idiot? Do you need this support? No, I'm absolutely not an idiot. I don't think you're an idiot. And, no. I mean, clearly I agree with what you're saying, Bev, about what's the point about this. I mean, we've all made it through to adulthood it's without... It's all Wellian, isn't it? It, it is. It is. And, and what, just to raise another concern as, as to what, what, what's been thrown into the mix already this morning, uh, as you've just pointed out, even even if your phone's on silent, this goes off. Mm. And there are a number of people, women in particular, who are living in abusive relationships who will keep a, a mobile phone that their husband doesn't know about yeah. or their Very partner doesn't know about. They'll keep it on silent. It's there if they need to call the emergency services yeah. or, or as a kind of escape route if they mm. need to contact someone in an emergency. And the idea that these phones will also be emitting this alarm. How I dare mean, they? could put That's people at risk. Do you How think the government they? have even thought about that? I, I have they to don't say, care. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know. But, how um, but I think this risk? is something important. I'm not understanding well, then the, husband, the, the, the partner how would the, how would knows the he's got the phone. He'll go, well, you've got a phone under but your he's bed. Not, but he's not there. No, if he is at home. Oh, I think when people if you're in an abusive relationship, husbands. in an abusive oh. relationship at home, so, so, the so bloke this, then hears it. Mm. And, so, so and this escape the safety valve. Yes. This is all about our safety. This takes away the battered Absolutely, woman's safety Absolutely, yes. Valve. Yeah, so at the moment, this is scheduled for a test. Um, I think it's 11 o'clock, Sunday, the 23rd yeah. of, of, of April. And, and it's that test in particular which could put people at risk. If people don't know about it and have one of these secret phones and don't turn it off, you know, it could be hidden in their bedside drawer, for yeah. example. You're going to have to hide it under the mattress. That is going to emit an alarm and that could then expose See, somebody. Unless you put it under the mattress, I think Who knows how loud it's going to be? Yeah. I've turned on. mine off. If you're very clever and you've got the time and the commitment and the will to do it, you can go onto your phone, you can go through your settings and there is an emergency alert thing on there which, Look, is, which will have appeared on your phone settings. without you uploading it. Go through my settings. And I've done Baffling. it. I wouldn't you know don't know what settings start. is, love. No. You've got no idea. But, but just, just, you know, I spoke to my kids about this. And this is what matters. It's about the interaction with the state and the individual and the psychology and what it's doing to us. And my kids were saying, yeah, but, Mummy, there might be something that's going to kill us and we need to know. I said, kids, there's nothing going to kill you. No, but there might be something that's going to kill us and we need to know. What we're doing but to the mindset of teenagers even, thinking even that they're in mortal danger... Even if it was going to kill you and you were alluded to it, it doesn't mean you can be safe. <laughs> <Not quite. laughs> that's when you know you're yeah. going to die. You know you're going to die. Yeah, so it gives you a warning. Yeah, it gives you Actually, might, I could open might, a bottle you, of wine. You might rather not want <laughs> to know. The, no, I don't want to know. You see, in the movies where they know the comet's coming. That's right. Yeah. Got like two weeks to prepare, and it's, it's not a good thing. No, it isn't. No, it's honestly, I think it's deeply sinister. Now, talking of prepared, right. do you think Nicola Sturgeon oh. was tipped off the former first minister that the yeah. police were arriving you at see, her this home? This is the question. You know, when she made that resignation speech seven weeks ago, my first thought was, "There's a rabbit off here. What's she hiding? What's behind?" Now we probably know. Well, this, I said at the this time, was, this is all about too. the police investigation. Me too, because because the week before. Um, Operation Branch Form, which, yeah. which is the one inv uh, interviewing everyone, that started to interview people, that group of coppers. So don't tell me she didn't know mm. that, because it's looking very much to me like the, the police are working with the SNP, because it's looking like they waited to arrest Peter Morrell until after the election happened, until there was a little bit of stability. Now, but you know what? You know what really gets me about Sturgeon? She was so scathing of Boris during yeah. the party gate. Yeah. She was yeah. calling the moral the high ground. Yes. Mark. Mm. She was saying, what a stinking Very rotten good mess. Point. What a stinking rotten mess this is. Because this mm. isn't just about Morel and the six and the six hundred grand that was going to be used for the for a second and the referendum. Loan, and his own it personal loan to own the SP. And Sturgeon was asked in the weeks before she resigned, she was asked by people in Scotland, didn't make, I don't think it made the media here, whether that loan, that hundred and seven grand that was taken from their joint bank account and she always refused to say so she knew that a ton of trouble mm. was coming and she knew it would make her position as first minister completely untenable yeah. and i just think this this shows you know, just to say she has always denied that she, she has knows, always denied but i suspect she has the police denied. might ask her but because she was the police, leader of the smp the, the police have a duty to ask her but what i thought was delicious yesterday they were searching her bins yeah. and i thought yeah. 
good because <laughs> actually the law should apply to you yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that tent on the front garden, oh. it, I thought, God, this is line of duty. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, the whole thing stinks, doesn't yeah, it? Does. It absolutely stinks. And I'm prepared to accept that Sturgeon perhaps didn't know the precise time and yeah. date yes. at which that knock was going to occur yeah. on the door. Um, but clearly this has been in the running. We've known, we've all known. They arrived at 7.32, Joanne, and she was out the house in a car at 8 o'clock. I mean, I'm, I'm So I'm that sure. didn't give her much time to get ahead and no, pack her bags, did it? No, no. But, but the whole thing stinks. And what's more, it's the smell that lingers. And I think it lingers now over Hamza Yusuf. Yeah. It, it calls He's her into successor. question. Absolutely. Um, but the election was rushed through. Yeah. You know, it was six weeks start to finish. He was presented as the continuity yeah. candidate. And I think Kate Forbes and her supporters, I mean, she, she only lost narrowly, like, let's she, remember. She 48%. 48 to 52. And, absolutely. and barely half the party voted for yeah. him. I mean, you wondered why at the time this was happening. But the thing is, he's a lost cause now because he can't actually now, he can bang on about Westminster withholding the right of a second rec referendum, but he's got nowhere to go now with independence. This party is completely discredited now as a whole. It was mm. always something, you talk about the smell, I always thought it is really unhealthy that this First Minister who's been first minister for eight years, her husband was yeah. chief executive yeah. of the yeah, party exactly. that's run exactly. Scotland for some... Yes. He'd, I mean, been it, first, he'd been chief executive since 1988. No, absolutely. He knows I mean, where all the bodies are buried. Completely. I mean, this would be the type of thing you might expect in some kind of banana republic. Yeah, I agree. You know, this is not a serious political party for a, a, a nation. This is not how you would expect but things the, to be the done. The of all of this really gets to me, actually, because, you know, when she made that speech, it was all about, you know, I've got no, nothing left in the tank and I'm tired <laughs> and I want to see yeah. It's all hypocritical. Mm. It's just nonsense. It appears, yeah. This was coming and she knew the ball was rolling towards her. And we allowed her, or Scotland allowed her, a dignified exit in Parliament where she was allowed to have a few tears and say, this has been mm. the greatest honour of my life. And they, well, all the time that was happening, I'm thinking, you would not be resigning. Mm. You would not be yeah. leaving unless there was something yeah. in the but, but there's another hypocrisy as well, yeah. I think, which really comes from um, certainly not anybody in the room here or in GB News, but other branches of the media where Sturgeon and the SNP more broadly, it seems to have had a bit of a free pass yes, in getting away with some yes. of these things. Completely. I mean, if this had been Boris, for example, yeah. and, oh, and, and yeah. this had been something going on in Westminster with the Conservative Party, you know, I think a lot more would be being mm. made of this. People would be horrified. It would be scandal. It would be wall-to-wall -wall talk of corruption. In actual fact, you know, there's a few front pages today. I have to say, not universal. It's not on every front page. And, and there's this slight sense of them, you know, they're, they're kind of one of those, they're on side, so the they can have a nod and a wink and, and just not that much criticism as you might expect. Nationalism and especially Scottish nationalists and the people who are in that organisation, they will always make excuses for this. They will find a reason not to believe it, mm -hmm. to think it's the rest of us having a go at them. You know, I mean, I've had a look on Twitter already and, and, and there are gnats sticking up for them and saying, you know, that, that this is all like witch hunts and all the rest. It's nonsense, you know. And it, I don't think it'll take the popularity down with the diehards. I think they will always be there, but maybe it'll sway the waverers. Can you, mm. yeah, and I'm trying to think of a precedent in Britain for a political leader a prime minister, effectively, the longest serving mm -hmm. primes in Europe, having their home raided by the police and yes. having a forensic tent slapped in the front garden. No. Can you think of any precedent? Well, the only person no. I can think of at the moment is Donald Trump, actually. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. parallels, yeah. aren't there? Exactly. I mean, Boris was accused of having a bit of cake and a glass of Prosecco. And he got I mean, a £50 is... pound penalty fine. Yeah. yeah, this is on a slightly different scale. Yeah. Right, uh, moving on. Let's talk about Sunak defending the plans to house the migrants on uh, these floatels. Carol, is this going to be the solution <laughs> to the he's, problem? He's saying it's right and fair. And I do think it's right and fair, you know. I mean, they're going to be in a, a nice seaside resort. Uh, we've all seen the pictures of inside the bar. Just very nice. It's 220 rooms. There's a gym. There's a pool table. They're going to get free, free board, free, um, free health care. They're going to be looked after. They're going to get money to go in and out of town. The local council gets three thousand pounds per migrant. The local council gets that. And but you know we can't have a situation that's costing six million quid a day to house illegal migrants. Let's not forget. We're not just talking about. We're talking about illegal migrants. We can't be paying six million quid a day. Each migrant here is going to cost fifty quid a day to look after them. This is good enough. You know it doesn't have to be luxury. You know it has to be. It has to meet all the requirements of humanitarian and utilitarian. And and this does meet all of our obligations. And it's good. I mean, I, I get why people in Dorset are upset, because there was no consultation. Well, we talked to local MP yesterday, Richard yeah, Drax. Richard the Drax. first he knew yeah. about it was when he read it in the papers. I'm looking for the pictures. Of one, here we go. Here's the, here's the boat. It's, it's bar, yeah. gym, right. en suite. The Mail have got this yeah. uh, pictures of it here. And I mean, you know, it's not... It, well, it, 
it's perfectly, it's perfectly What's nice. Wrong with it? If you're fleeing <laughs> war and persecution, it's a pretty yeah. nice place to be. Yeah. You're on sweet mm. rooms. And, and also in Holland, they use this in Holland to it. house migrants. All over the EU. And, and in fact, they were going to use the, one of the RAF bases in, in Yorkshire, and I think they've pulled back on that. That, that would have housed 2,000. It's, uh, but it's only 500 people, Joe. Absolutely. I mean, the fact is, there is just simply no easy solution to this, unless we actually manage somehow to stop migrants arriving. We need to get the planes the up to Rwanda. Well, unless something like that happens, which will be a deterrent, I mean, I suspect people will still try to come even mm. when that system is in place. Um, you have to put people somewhere. Hotels are very expensive, and the danger is they, they act as a pull factor, mm. actually attracting people in. Yes. If that, that the word goes yeah. round, yeah. you get put Th up in locally. This might add to the sense exactly. of deterrent. Exactly. You're not going to be in a nice hotel, exactly. you're going to be in a barge. And, and I actually think having a deterrent in place like that is a, is a humanitarian thing to do. Mm. What's not humanitarian is letting people risk their lives crossing the channel of the most perilous sea route uh, that you can take. OK, right, ladies, right. we've run out of time. Right, you'll be back in just a little while, won't you? But still to come, King Charles is in York for the Maundy service. He's been met with an interesting crowd. We'll give you the details uh, in just a moment. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Wednesday's rain is clearing now, but heavy showers follow for many of us. In between, some bright spells and certainly feeling warmer compared with yesterday. The weather fronts that pushed the rain in during Wednesday are now clearing, but they're slowing down, and so some persistent rain lingering for the far northeast of Aberdeenshire into Orkney and Shetland through the rest of the morning. And for the first part of the afternoon as well, Shetland keeps the rain throughout the day. Elsewhere, a brighter sky, still a lot of cloud and some showers. The liveliest downpours likely across central and southern as well as eastern parts of England where there could be some thunderstorms in places, even some hail. But away from the showers, sunshine and temperatures up to 15 or 16 Celsius in the south. Feeling colder where we've got that uh, persistent rain towards the northeast of Scotland. That continues into the evening but it eventually fizzles out overnight across Shetland. A lot of cloud remains in the North Sea but elsewhere showers die away and the clouds disappear. As a result, a frosty night to come in rural spots and even in towns and cities, temperatures dipping to two to four Celsius. So a chilly start to Good Friday, but actually for most, it's a sunny start and long spells of sunshine continue through the morning and into the afternoon for the vast majority. One exception, some of these North Sea coastal counties where we're going to see low cloud reappear through the day, some mistiness around the beaches and some drizzle. That's going to make it feel colder, 10 to 12 Celsius on the North Sea coast, but where we've got the sunshine elsewhere, 12 to 16 degrees. So a pleasant afternoon to come for the vast majority. And that continues into the evening as well as much of the weekend. Saturday and Sunday are looking like a repeat performance with plenty of warm sunny spells across the UK. Still some of that low cloud affecting North Sea coasts. By Monday, a spell of rain followed by showers. Bye-bye. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And you view Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock.
I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Good morning. You are watching To The Point on GB News with me, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. And we're talking about MPs for Hire, the Tory MP who offered to work for the gambling industry for money. Uh, we're going to be talking also to the Tory MP who dodged the sting. He's one of our very own, so stay tuned for that. Also this morning, a local opposition is building to Rishi Sunak's migrant barge plan. The Bibby Stockholm will dock off the Dorset coast, providing accommodation for 500 people. Doesn't look too bad, does it? Would you be happy for migrants to be housed offshore near you? Well, they've got to go somewhere. And can you believe this? Some Met police officers who've got convictions, even for sexual offences, are still serving officers. The Met chief is now looking into it, and he's happened to move 100 police officers involved in the war against terror to do just that. And will it be the Easter holiday from hell? The Port of Dover is building temporary marquees to check passports. To avoid another weekend of travel chaos, drivers are being warned to expect big jams from today as nearly 17 million cars hit the road over this Easter weekend. As ever, we, as ever, we want to know what you think, so do email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. We're going to get all the latest headlines now with Rhiannon Jones. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning. It's two minutes past 11. Your top stories from the GB newsroom. Counter-terrorism officers, along with those who tackle serious organised crime, have been drafted in to help clean up the Met Police workforce. Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley believes there are hundreds of corrupt officers who shouldn't be in the job and he wants to weed them out. Of more than 1,000 cases, nearly 700 will be reassessed, with almost 200 referred to formal risk management or vetting. Figures also reveal 161 serving Met officers have criminal convictions. Former Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has pulled out of a climate change event this evening after her husband was released from custody without charge. The home of Ms Sturgeon and the former SNP chief executive remains cordoned off pending further investigation. Peter Murrell was arrested as part of a probe into SNP finances, including £600,000 set aside for Scotland's independence campaign. Ms Sturgeon insists she had no prior knowledge of police plans or intentions ahead of her resignation in February. A 23-year-old man has denied murdering beautician Elle Edwards in Merseyside. Connor Chapman pleaded not guilty at Liverpool Crown Court, appearing by video link from Manchester Prison. He's also charged with possessing a submachine gun with intent to endanger life. 26-year-old Miss Edwards was shot dead in the Lighthouse pub in Wirral just before midnight on Christmas Eve. 
Sir Keir Starmer has promised to introduce specialist rape courts if Labour wins the next election. It comes amid a record backlog in the courts, which sees victims face an average three-year wait for justice. Government analysis shows the number of rape survivors dropping their cases has more than doubled since 2015. Sir Keir has described the state of the justice system under the Conservatives as a national scandal. New research has found more than 45,000 burglaries reported last year were unattended by police in England. Data obtained by the Lib Dems shows more than 120 break-ins a day took place without an officer visiting the scene. 75% of cases were found to be closed without identifying a suspect. The party has referred to it as a postcode lottery and is calling for officers to be legally required to visit victims. Drivers face major travel disruption over the Easter weekend with up to 17 million cars predicted to hit the road. Research by the RAC shows 2.7 million car journeys are expected on both Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Rail engineering work, including closure of London Euston Station all weekend, will make the roads even busier. Travel expert Simon Calder told us it's the wrong time to be carrying out rail works. It's really odd that given that the airway which is of course as we have talked about many times in desperate states in terms of losing one-fifth of its uh, passenger numbers they desperately would get people back and so what do they do well they close everything down over easter so that exactly the people they need to attract um, people who are thinking okay well i'll switch from um, uh, road to rail um, just look at it and just think well i'm not going to bother with that it looks um, an absolute mess the government's approved a £48 million fund to make England's most dangerous roads safer. The money will go towards improving signage and road markings, as well as reducing congestion and emissions. Allocations of which roads will receive the funding are based on data by the Road Safety Foundation, based on the number of people killed and traffic levels. Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Roads and Local Transport, Richard Holden, told us they're trying to tackle the 27 worst roads around the country. This money is going to really help save lives as well. Uh, we estimate around 750 uh, fatalities or serious injuries will be prevented over the next 20 years uh, by this investment. Alongside uh, driver behaviour, actually some of these junctions and these road surfaces um, are some of the major issues we see uh, when we're uh, trying to tackle uh, issues around road safety in the country. Millions of mobile phones across the UK will sound an alarm this month in a new test to warn the public of danger. The alert systems intended for use in life-threatening situations, including flooding and wildfires. The message will become will come through at 3 p.m. on the 23rd of April and will vibrate for up to 10 seconds. The test, though, is scheduled for St George's Day and it clashes with major events, including the London Marathon and Premier League matches. Hundreds of patients with breast and prostate cancer could benefit from a new drug. The NHS-approved tablet, Olaparib, prevents cancerous cells from repairing their DNA. Men with advanced prostate cancer and women with early breast cancer at high risk of the disease returning will be able to access it through NHS England. The Institute of Cancer Research has called the decision life-changing, saying the medicine gives patients a chance to live longer and healthier lives. And the US president has accepted an invite from the king for a state visit to the UK. The White House says Joe Biden had a very friendly chat with King Charles over the phone. The president's due to visit Northern Ireland and the Republic next week, but won't attend the coronation in May. He'll be represented instead by his wife, Jill. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. It's back to Bev and Andrew. Do you think Joe Biden's sulking, not coming to the coronation? Because it's the first coronation, as we know, since 1953. He was relegated to a very minor seat in Westminster mm. Abbey at the Queen's funeral. I couldn't even... I think I caught a glimpse of him once. He was behind yeah. ca uh, Commonwealth leaders. Mm. Uh, and I suspect his nose was mightily put out of joint. And they can't really roll him out in public because he's barely capable of holding himself together. 
Long they know he's a risk. Long journey on a plane. Yeah. People will ask him questions. They'll ask him questions about yeah. Trump. He's got his own issues, of course, about his own documents that were found in That's his home. That's right. Car. But it's amazing, just sending the First Lady. Well, he, he, he's literally, I think, every time he opens his mouth, something in a, know. you know, odd and... All the world heads of state that will be there, but the leader of the free world won't be. He can't really walk down plane stairs without falling over. Like, he's, he's a huge risk to, to take to the other side of the world for such a big state occasion. Let's talk about another world leader. Well, she was. The former chief executive of the SNP <laughs> and uh, the husband of Nicola Sturgeon, that's Peter Murrow, he's been released without charge after being detained and questioned by the police for 11 hours. Mm. Sturgeon has pledged to fully cooperate with investigators following the arrest yesterday morning, which saw officers seen taping off and searching the couple's Glasgow home. That forensic tent in the front garden. I still think it's really weird. I, I, I mean, it must just... Searching her bins. I just don't understand it. I mean... If he if he was burning documents or whatever, you know, if that's the allegation, surely he wouldn't be sticking them in his own barbecue. You wouldn't, you wouldn't bury documents under your um, lawn. It is. I mean, this is all to do with the £600,000 of SNP money, which apparently wasn't spent the way it should have been. And also, he's got to explain the loans that he left, gave to the SNP back in 2019. I mean... £7,000. He didn't declare... It wasn't declared. I, this is... OK, you've heard me joke about MPs filling suitcases with cash. Like, if he's literally filled a suitcase with all this cash and he's buried it in his garden, then I might just officially retire. My work here will be done. Yeah. <laughs> But I don't think that's what's happening. <laughs> we're going we're to go to Glasgow now, where we can talk to our Scotland reporter, Tony Maguire. Tony, lots of speculation that there could be more people pulled in for questioning and potentially even arrested. Yes, can I just say a quite enjoyable exchange there? It very much makes us... Bad. Um, but certainly quite, you know, anyone who thought that perhaps day to day would die down a little bit was sorely mistaken. Over the last hour, we've just seen and oh. exit the property, including in the last five minutes, quite a lot of uh, of plain clothes as well. Now, we, we a police van pull up, but, whatever Tony, is we'll going on inside the, the property. Sorry, the line's very poor. Is. We're going to break off from Tony. We're going to talk to oh. the HuffPost uh political editor Kevin Schofield, who just happens to be a very seasoned Scot and knows the SNP better than most. Kevin, this is an extraordinary, extraordinary story. It certainly is, Andrew, yeah. Um, quite a dramatic uh, reversal in fortunes. I mean, it's only, what, six, seven weeks since Nicola Sturgeon stood down, took the political world by surprise, by, by standing down. Uh, and yesterday's developments were, yeah, quite remarkable. Um, the sight of you know, a tent in the front garden, a police tent in the front garden of former First Minister, uh, police officers coming and going, uh, really not anything that you would expect to see, quite frankly. And the repercussions of this could be huge and also puts more pressure on Hamza Youssef, Nicola Sturgeon's successor, just a couple of weeks after he took on the job. Kevin, does, has Nicola Sturgeon traditionally had a good relationship with the police in Scotland or not? Because this looks like they've over-egged the pudding here. This looks like a huge uh, display of police force. Is, is she popular with the police? Uh, I'm not sure whether she's popular or not. Obviously, there has to be, uh, quite rightly, a distinction, a, a, a distancing of the relationship, really, between politicians and the police. The police must be independent and be allowed to get on with their work, regardless of, of who it is that, that they're investigating. So I don't think there's a question of her not being popular. I think it's the police for whatever reason. Obviously, it's difficult to second guess exactly what they're doing in their investigations, but this is police being as thorough as possible. Obviously, yeah, you're right, it has raised a few eyebrows the way that it's been done, but, you know, they may well be quite um, standard for this type of investigation. As you say, Mr Murrow was questioned for 11 hours um, at Falkirk Police Station yesterday and released last night without charge pending further investigation. So I think this inquiry certainly has still quite a long way to run. She was due to make a major speech tonight, Kevin, on climate change. She's pulled out. Um, clearly, she knows there's only going to be one question in town. What did she know? What does she know? Is she going to be questioned by the police too? Yeah, no real surprise that she's pulled out of this um, public appearance. I think, as, as, as you say, it would completely overshadow... It was a, a, a climate change event. It would completely overshadow that event, um, guys like me would, would be desperate to, to get her thoughts on what is going on. So I think she's quite quite wisely keeping her head down. She's probably like the rest of us, just wondering where this story is going to go next.
Absolutely, we really are. Thank you, Kevin. Um, HuffPost UK political editor, Kevin Schofield. She's saying the trade, that one's going to run and run and run. I'm going to send Tony Maguire to go and have a look under that blue tent, what is in that garden. <laughs> I'm so gutted that we lost him there. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's just like a, a working room, like a, an evidence base where they will... Oh, were they digging up the garden? I, I, honestly, it baffles me. Anyway, let us know what you think. <laughs> GBviews at gbnews.uk is the email address. Now, here's another remarkable story. Nearly 200 serving Met Police staff with past accusations of sex crimes or domestic abuse. Some of them have got convictions for sexual offences are going to be all risk assessed all over again. Absolutely. As the already under fire Met Police Force continues to uh, try and change its culture, hundreds more officers and staff are having old allegations re-examined. Our reporter Paul Hawkins is at Scotland Yard for us now. Paul, we're still jaws dropping that there are people with uh, convictions for sex offences who are still serving police officers. Yeah, Andrew, it's quite a remarkable update from the Met Police Chief Mark Rowley in this uh, letter to Suella Bradman, the Home Secretary, and also the Mayor of London, uh, Sadiq Khan, updating them on that investigation to more than 1,000 officers reassessed, reinvestigated for uh, uh, sexual violence and domestic uh, abuse. Um, 90 officers, in fact, extra officers, have been taken away from terrorism, away from special operations, and drafted in to help the Met's team that is dealing with this. And all this coming, of course, as the Met tries to improve the public level of trust and confidence in the force following the publication of the Casey report, which said there was uh, rampant misogyny, uh, institutional racism uh, within the force itself, and, of course, Wayne Cousins and David Carrick uh, as well, uh, really damaging the reputation of the Metropolitan Police. This is all part of that process. And in his letter, he was updating them on the investigation so far. So just to take through some of the statistics uh, involving uh, this investigation then, uh, 1,131 individuals reinvestigated. Uh, 246 will face no formal action because correct action was taken at the time. Uh, 689 will undergo a new assessment to pursue new or missed lines of inquiry, including possibly talking again to victims and witnesses. 196 face formal risk management measures and potentially a review to determine if they should remain in the force. Now, also in this letter, uh, Mark Rowley said that 161 Met officers have criminal convictions. Of these, 76 for serious traffic offences, so things like uh, drink driving, uh, 49 are for dishonesty or violence, eight committed the offences as police officers and are still with the force, and three have convictions for sexual offences. Mark Rowley also says that all 50,000 staff and serving officers within the Met uh, are being uh, checked uh, against the Police National Database. They've done 10,000 of those 50,000 so far. Uh, 38 potential cases of misconduct, 55 cases of off-duty association with a criminal. Uh, in the next six months, he says about 100 officers may have to leave the organisation. He says that there could be hundreds over the next two to three years. And, in fact, uh, he's considering banning anyone with convictions except the most minor offences. All of this to try and re-establish public trust and confidence in the organisation. In fact, there's a BBC YouGov survey today that says uh, um, a 1,000 people surveyed and almost half of women totally distrusted the Met. Uh, and we've also heard today from the uh, chairman of London's Police and Crime Committee, Susan Hall, who, commenting on uh, Sir Mark Rowley's findings, says that uh, things are going to get much worse before they get better when it comes to the Metropolitan Police. OK, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. I trust the police. I'm a woman. I trust yeah. the police. But the, the Met has become a basket case. But do you know eight, what... Eight of those offences were committed where they were serving police officers and they're still in the uniform. That is baffling. But you see, what we you know what will help restore faith in the police? Solve crimes. Just solve our crimes. When we, when we call and we report a crime, solve it. Yeah, and maybe then we'll see, trust you. Maybe see a Bobby on the beat. That would be nice. Okay. Like a blue moon. Right. Conservative MP uh, Scott Benton, he had the uh, party whip suspended. He was filmed offering help uh, to the gambling industry in exchange for financial reward. We know he's stupid and greedy, but we're asking, are our MPs for hire and do they have too little to do? Well, with us this morning is, uh, well, Conservative MP, but we know him as GB News presenter Philip Davies, as well as GB News investigates reporter Charlie Peters. Now, why on earth would we have you two in the studio to talk about this story? <gasps> Tell us what happened, Phil. 
Well, I was approached by this this fake company, Tar Partners. The who, same one? Yes, they sent an email stopped. to me saying that, you know, they were, they were representing mm -hmm. a rich Indian billionaire or something and where they wanted to invest in the UK and they wanted uh, somebody to uh, to help them in, uh, in, in politics and they'd identified me. Now, I, I replied and said, look, uh, one, MPs aren't allowed to lobby on behalf mm -hmm. of businesses. Two... Uh, MPs are not allowed to give parliamentary advice. Three, I'm not interested in a job. Mm. Uh, but look, if you if you still want to meet, I'm very happy to. But given the above, you you probably don't want to. Uh, and they replied back and said, "Oh, well, actually, we'd, we we'd still like to meet up with you." Actually, so um, I, I thought it was uh, was very fishy. But I thought it was too good a journalistic opportunity to pass up. Uh, and so contacted Charlie, who did a lot of uh, of the. Um, uh, the, the background research into this company, which just en enhanced our view that this was very fishy. And so um, we went along to hear what they had to say and how they, and how they did it, because it was too good a journalistic opportunity to miss, wasn't it? So what did you find, Charlie, when uh, Phil spoke to you and said, uh, mm -hmm. this, this is a bit whiffy? Um, many obvious examples of fraudulence, I'd say. Um, the office didn't exist. I turned up there pretending to be a delivery man and the receptionist had no idea who Tar Partners were. I phoned their landline. It put me to an overflow company. I asked them how long they'd be taking calls for Tar Partners and they said four days. Right. Um, the LinkedIn profile for this William Kent, we now know as a senior investigative journalist at the Times, zero followers and didn't exist until the week before. So we were almost certain it was a sting, but actually a small part of us really hoped that it was an incompetent foreign family trying to yeah. mug off MPs and we could possibly get a, an alternative sting there. So mm. we, we went to this meeting, I think, with all opportunities on the table, hoping for either story, but it quickly became apparent so that our you, original... So you turned the tables on the stingers? Yes, it was a very bizarre situation in which I was sat next to Philip in this meeting where there were two sets of investigative journalists filming each other, um, <laughs> which is not a particularly normal way to spend and your Thursday never, morning. And they never smelt a rat? No, absolutely not. That well, they clearly don't watch enough GB News, Charlie, because yeah. they'd have known exactly who you were. Uh, I, was, I was disguised as an art student. They wouldn't have picked up on me. When you were, to, was it, when you were talking to Philip, did it, did it seem even more obvious to you? Well, to be honest, they were very good. Were they? They were very, very good, I have to say that. So I went there knowing, in my own mind, this was a fake company yeah. mm. who were just trying to, 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 to do a sting. Um, by the time the meeting had finished, I wasn't so sure anymore that they were a fake company. Really? They were very, very good. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was, a, there was still the things that didn't add up, but actually there was a, there was a chance that they were a legitimate company, that they, were, they actually existed, but were just trying to act in a sort of corrupt manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's how good they were, because I went knowing that they were a fake company, if yeah. you see what I mean, and I still... So, they were, they, you know, when you ask them a question, when I ask them questions about who the family was, why is it they needed somebody to help them with regulation when all they were doing was investing in companies that already had people who did regulations mm. and all these sorts of things? They never missed a beat with an answer. Did they offer you money? And if so, how much? No, we never got... I mean, I made it clear, like I say, right from the word right. go, I, I didn't want a job, I wasn't interested in a job, um, and uh, I'd made that clear in the email to them. I made it clear again in the meeting with them that it was, I wasn't interested. I also made it clear to them in the meeting as well. I have no idea why they'd want to employ an MP to do the stuff they were asking for mm. anyway. Um, so, um, you know, but, but they, they were... I've got to take my hat off to the two reporters. They were very, very good. Mm -hmm. They'd done lots and lots of research and preparation and practice cleaning. Mm. They never missed a beat whenever you asked them any kind of question at all. And so did you take off your painter's smock or whatever it was that you were wearing to disguise <laughs> yourself as an art student and say, ta-da, it's really us? No, I, I hung around for a bit and, and waited for their conversation after Phil had left, and which that kind of confirmed to me more of our original suspicion. But I'd say, you know, while they were very convincing performers in the act they put on, they did a really excellent job. They even fooled me for a few minutes. Yeah. Mm. Um, the setup was sloppy. And I think who this reflects extremely poorly on is Scott Benton, because he fell for this sting, which yeah. we exposed yeah. as being fake uh, within a few moments. They were convincing, though, from but, what Philip was saying. I know, but, but the but, setup was so. You was smelt it? a rat, but he's a very inexperienced MP in the sense he only got in 2019. He's going to lose his seat, I would say, with a majority of 3,000. Mm -hmm. I think he thought, let's get a bit of cash in the bank before he loses his seat. Well, look, I mean, I'm not here to, to stick the boot into Scott Benton, and, you know, I, we are. I, I didn't hear... <laughs> I am. You are. <laughs> yeah, you are. certainly are. But, I, but, look, I don't know. I didn't hear the full conversation or anything. I've no idea. He, mm. said, he said afterwards that he, he reflected on it and didn't... He didn't pers sign pers up. ..didn't yeah. pursue it and all the rest of it. Uh, look, I, I, I've always... I've known Scott. I, I've always thought he's a decent guy. Mm. I can't tell you what his motivation was. You'd have to speak to, mm. to him about that. <laughs> but, they, but coming back to Bev's point, they were, they, were very, very, they were very, very good. They were very, very good. But MP but, should not be in a position to be appearing to have rent no. themselves out to a no, high No, no, clear, clearly not. There are, there are clear rules which are in place for good reason, 
that MPs should not be uh, lobbying on behalf of anybody mm. uh, that pays them. They should not be giving parliamentary advice. Those rules are perfectly clear. They're there for a good reason. And there's no excuse, really, for any MP to want to try and flout them. Okay, Where do we see both. the film? Where, where do we see the film? Oh, it's online. It's on our website. Good two minutes. Very good. Have a look on GB News website. Well done, you two. Thanks both. Right, still to come, the King is in York. We'll tell you why in just two minutes. This is GB News. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Rooms, apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. It's 11.26, you're with the, to the point with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner on GB News. Now, for the first time in the Church of England's history, over a quarter of churches are not holding Sunday services. Attendances have plunged by over 20% since pre-COVID levels, uh, not, due to, due to, not due to fall in demand, but rather fall in supply. So what is going on with the Church of England and why can't they provide enough services for their already dwindling congregation? Let's ask Graham Nichols, Director of Affinity Gospel Churches, who joins us now. Good morning, Graham. Um, so what's going on? Is it that less people, fewer people want to go to church or that the churches just aren't available for them to attend? Uh, I think it's complicated. I think it's more the latter that um, it's not so much that there's a complete lack of demand. Uh, but I think it's the structures of the Church of England mean that there are many vicars who are spanning maybe four or five, or I think in some cases 20 churches, um, uh, which is a kind of bigger picture of the decline of, of attendance in village churches and the ageing population and so on. So there's complicated factors going back and forth, really. But it's more a, an issue of... Um, a lack of resources um, and there may be covid factors there's structural factors in the church of england uh, i think the church of england is a bit demoralized at the moment with with the debates going on and so forth um, so there's lots of factors there 
The, set, the last census, Graham, I think, showed for the first time fewer yeah. than half of people identify themselves now as Christian in this country, which I found deeply depressing. Yeah, um, I mean, I think in reality, the what, what you might call evangelical Christians who, who would not just uh, tick the box for Christianity, but would say they believe the Bible and they believe the gospel and exclusive claims of Christ and so on, probably you're talking five, six percent of the population um, who are what you might call committed. Um, I mean, that's pretty low bar. I think it's, it, a 10 church once a month, I think a recent survey was was five or six percent. Um, so, yeah, committed is, is pretty small. So we are a minority. But actually, there are churches where where they're they're vibrant and they're growing um, and they're pretty well resourced as well. So there is there is encouragement, but there's a particular Anglican factor going on. What's going on with your gospel churches, Graham? Have you got lots of bums on pews, if you pardon the pun? Um, yeah, uh, broadly speaking, our kinds of churches are, are either sort of maintaining the same levels or growing, not growing massively. We'd, we'd love them to be growing faster. But broadly speaking, the kind of evangelical independent churches um, where they're orthodox teaching but contemporary style, they tend to be growing. Mm. Um, and have lots of young people. Our own church has pretty much people who are in membership from every decade, um, as in every decade of life um, uh, from being born. So, uh, so yeah, good range, lots of encouragement, lots of good stuff going on, lots of good social work, lots of good preaching work happening. So it's not really a discouraging picture. We just like more. And there's the rest of the population that we're trying to reach as well at the same time. Graham, what do people get out of the church? As, as a faithless person, yeah. just just sell it to me. Anybody sitting at home and thinking, oh, yeah. I don't feel I need this in my life. What do you get from the church? You know what? That's, that's a fantastic question because, in a <laughs> way, um, you get you know you get eternal life, but uh, and you get dignity and and, and purpose yeah, and all those life. sort of things. But it's not really a consumer sell, is it? It's more of a um, if you think it's true. Uh, you know, the, the story of Easter that's coming up, of Jesus dying in the place of sinners and offering you eternal life. If you think it's true, then you want to learn more about it and you want to be with other Christians and worship God and those sort of things. If you just want to be entertained or some social club, there are, there are probably, you know, as good things that you could go to. It's a good social club and it's a good network and it's good fun, but, you know, don't come to us for that. Come to us because you want eternal life. Um, and then we can help you with that because I'm not that entertaining. You know, you could probably find someone better at preaching, not better at preaching, better but at you telling. See, you lost me there. This is the trouble. Okay, I'm, I'm on board with the social side. I'm on board with the community. <laughs> I'm on board with helping other people. I'm yeah. on board. I'm, I'm even sort of on board with the meditation aspect, with the prayer aspect. Yeah. I think there's something quite beautiful and spiritual about that particular activity in a group of people. But I don't really, I, I'm hedging my bets if I'm going for eternal life. That's not going to get me over the threshold at eight o'clock on a Sunday morning, is it? Would me. No, but if it's true, then it would do, wouldn't it? But I mean, yeah. uh, the, the, I mean you're being very honest about it. And, and uh, yeah, the, the truth is is what's more important, whether it's true or not. I mean, if it's, if it's not true, we're just a bunch of nutters, really, aren't we? Oh, so, uh, you well, said it, not me, Graham. No, but speak for yourself, because uh, tonight is Maundy, it's Maundy <laughs> Thursday, so it's the Last yes. Supper, the washing of the feet in the Catholic yes. Church. What will yes. you be doing in your gospel yes. church tonight, <laughs> Graham? In our particular church, we're, we're not, we don't do so much for Maundy Thursday. What we right. did do a couple of weeks ago, which was have a Passover meal, like right. the traditional Jewish Passover demonstrated, which was really interesting for everyone in the congregation. Um, which is what Jesus would have done on the Last Supper. And then Good Friday, we have services, Easter Sunday. Um, so, yeah, that's more the sort of calendar stuff we have over the weekend. Um, All right. and and what about true. Easter eggs? What about Easter eggs, yeah, Graham? Uh, we have an Easter egg hunt with our family. I've got some children and grandchildren and stuff. So we're doing Lovely. that on um, you've got it. You've won, her, you've won her over now. <laughs> you've won her over with the Easter eggs. Yeah. I want the chocolate yeah, now, well, the eternal life. She's easy to please. <laughs> Uh, Graham, thank you so children, much. Graham Nichols, the director of Affinity Gospel Churches, and a man who likes a bit of a laugh at the he whole does. thing. I can't, that, you know, that, that's brilliant. Religion's got to be able to laugh at itself. Oh, it's got to be. Well, when he's sitting there saying, what, what do you come here for? You come for yeah. eternal life. And well, can I just say, by the way, that no surprise that the Church of England's in crisis because Justin Moore of the Archbishop of Canterbury is useless. He's not exactly a great salesman, is he? He's not no. really, you know, no. managing to keep people on board. Absolutely. Uh, right, OK, well, uh, still to come, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex still haven't said whether they're going to go to the coronation. Oh, they're dragging this out, aren't they? Do you want them here? No. We're going to find out after the news with Rihanna Jones. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Bev. Good morning. It's 11.33, or top stories from the GB Newsroom. Counter-terrorism officers, along with those who tackle serious organised crime, have been drafted in to help clean up the Met Police workforce. Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley believes there are hundreds of corrupt officers who shouldn't be in the job, and he wants to weed them out. Of more than... Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I'm a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the program sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage. Here on GB News, we will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out...
The, king, the King's arrived in York for his first morning service, but we're going to talk papers first because mm. Carol Malone... Yes. She's still not told us if she's going to the coronation, that well, Duchess no, of it's, Sussex. It's, 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 yes, as the Sussexes. I, I mean, we're close now. We're, we're less than a month away. It's rude. And it, it is... Be, but this is so typical of them, isn't it? They're so entitled, they're so self-absorbed, they're not realising that 2,000 guests are going to this wedding, arrangements have to be... Wedding, coronation, that arrangements have to be made, and that just... I don't know why. Is it because hey, they're trying to work out what is in it for them? Is there a documentary or something? Mm. Or is it because he can't face the family after the book? Or does he, has he not been told where he's going to sit? Because Joanna... Well, no, we know um, he's not going to sit anywhere good. We know at uh, the Queen's funeral they were behind the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester. If they walked in this room now, nobody would recognise them except me. No, absolutely not. I mean, who knows what's behind this? I mean, I agree completely. It is just rude. And quite yeah. frankly, if it was a member of my family, you would not put up with it. You no. would just say, well, that's it. We will you ain't coming. But should the we should it, shouldn't they? They should yeah. say you're not coming Absolutely. And the, the other thing that I don't understand, though, is how he's made such a big deal about the importance of security, uh, uh, mm. the security for him and having the right protection yeah. in place. You'd think if that really was a priority, you'd want people to know your plans so that mm. all the arrangements could be made But, but that was you. hogwash, because we saw him turning up at the High Court for three days. Absolutely. Was it last week or the week before? And it makes me think they're just attention seekers. Mm. You know, this, this is about keeping them in the headlines. But, you know, the thing is, you know, he talks about his father. You know, if he loves his father at all, this is the biggest day of his life, probably, apart from his mm. wedding day. Which one? Who knows? Yes. But the, part of the, so, you know, he knows this is a big deal for Charles and he knows that Charles would want him to be there. And why they're just playing games? I mean, you know, in, in my head, it's always Meghan who's behind everything. Yeah, but we blame her, but he's the royal. Well, he, he, he should... should, he should but he should handle that. Exactly. He should also be the exactly. grown-up too. But yeah. remember, they're not going to be allowed to stand on the balcony. Well, because so they're that, not working they're, royals. Of course, but that that's going to be a blow to them. If they're going to be sat at the back like Biden was at the Queen's room... William's son is going to be a page in the procession. Yes, which is fantastic. But you, you would think... I think he's just got this. I think, you know, he, he said all this stuff in the book. He's not prepared to face them down. But don't you think Netflix will instruct them to go because they want so. their bucks? Mm. They want their bang for their bucks. I mean, Joanna. possibly. Who knows? Who know? we, we we don't know is the bottom line. So so it's all speculation. Quite frankly, you know, it gets a bit boring after a while. You think, come on, just just either you're coming or you're not coming. Yeah. Don't inflict this debate on the rest. Do you of want us. them there? I, I couldn't care less. No, I couldn't care less either. <laughs> I, I know, sorry, it sounds a bit mean, perhaps. Yeah. And I but think I, the British public don't want them. They've got either. to that point. After the, after spare, the, I think the public are really. I'd be quite them. worried for the royal family if they were there, yeah. knowing that. Harry has become a journalist to all mm. intents and purposes. He's become the thing that he says he despises. Yes. What notes is he taking? Mm. Will he what be taping people? Is he filming? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. And, and also I think we have to think about what's going to be on the pages, the front pages of the newspaper yeah. the following day because, as, as you say, it's the most important moment in King Charles's life. Mm. He, not unreasonably, will expect that it's going to be him who gets the headlines yeah, yeah. and the press coverage and the photographs. Mm. And the danger is if he, if Harry and Meghan come over, become the centre of attention, yeah. then... They will be it, the ones I mean, on the we front should pages. Underestimate the significance of the coronation. It will be it's a huge. worldwide event. It's the coronation of the most yes. famous king yes. on the planet. And, you know, there are, we there haven't had a coronation since 1953. There are heads of state coming from they all are. over the world, apart from Joe Biden, obviously. Um, but, and he's friends of the Sussexes, funny enough. I mean, they must know now whether they're coming. Yeah. Yeah. They can't be just deciding. They must yeah. know now. And, and this hang... I think the palace should just say, actually, you've left it too late. The, the RSVP Tate has gone, so... We're assuming you're not coming. Boom. Do you remember in the Netflix documentary, it's coming back to me now, there was an event that they were going to, that they all went to, and then Meghan was on the front page of the paper. And Meghan and Harry's interpretation of that event was, ooh, we took the headlines and Kate wasn't happy. Yes. Do you yes. remember? Yes, I do. And I wonder whether that's how they'll play this. We don't want to be there because we don't want to overshadow. Like, in their egotistical... Oh, you know, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. If you think about how they viewed it on... That the, the thing is, that the, the, the truth of it is, the media would have every camera on their faces. Yeah. <laughs> so they to, might be so, right. So yeah. they would be right. But here's the other thing. <laughs> will they be booed? I think they will be, because I, I suspect Carol Malone will be in the crowd. I'll be there. I'll be there. Cheering. Yeah, I'll You'll be organising and cheering, won't definitely. you? Definitely. No, I mean, I think they will be booed. You know, let's not forget, the pairs of slated the British public as racist. Mm -hmm. Harry has always said that one of the major reasons he left this country was because he thought that people were racist to Meghan. So, yeah, when, you, when, you, when you're being called a racist, it's not, it's not good. You know, I got into Deserve such trouble for saying in a, an interview, I'm sorry, when people look at 
the Duchess of Sussex, they do not see yeah. a woman of colour, a black woman. They just see a woman who's white who mm. happens she to have a black mother. She talks about it. I mean, I forgot what... The, uh, I read yesterday something like she's only a quarter. Yeah. And her kids are seven-eighths or something, whatever that... I don't matter. But the only person who talks about her colour is her. Mm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, right, is this a little bit of common sense from Michael Gove? Yes. We were talking about... We, we talk about this a lot on the show, and it's something that we both feel quite strongly about, the march of technology and yeah. apps and the digitisation of the future without us having enough discussions about whether we should be doing it. Uh, Michael Gove has said, Joanna, don't make drivers use parking apps. I think he's absolutely right on this. Uh, absolutely right. I mean, uh, uh, and he's, he's talking about it in relation to elderly people, yeah. people who might not have phones. I actually don't think... I uh, don't class myself quite as elderly <laughs> yet, and yet I share those frustrations. when You might have a few pounds coins in your pocket you only want to nip into a shop for a first few things you know quite happy to feed coins into a meter but to stand there and have to pull up a, an app on your phone and your registration number stand there keying in all your bank card details it is such a palaver you don't always want to have to do that and yet often you're left with no other option at all it's so frustrating and, and they wonder about the, the damage being done to the high street by online and yet these parking well there was a poll parking, I think, I think your, people off. your paper did a poll today saying that four out of ten people wouldn't go into town if this was the case. I was in Ealing yesterday and I was trying to park my car and the app wasn't working. Now, it, it took me all my time to get my head around the blooming app in the first place, yeah. but it wasn't working. It kept on asking me to do something. I was doing it and it wouldn't work. So, in the end, I had to leave my car illegally parked. Terrified. I was stressed all the time. And you could have got time. a ticket. Yeah. Well, it, I did, a couple of weeks ago in Chiswick, the lovely Belinda DeLucy, who works on this station, well, her and I were having a coffee somewhere, she set the apple for me because I can't, and don't you ever get a call. Never, you, not you'd a be chance. totally and utterly lost. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and she set it up for me, and I got a ticket. Yeah. And they said I hadn't paid it, and I had to go through the palaver, sending all the screenshots oh. and everything into the thing, and I still haven't heard whether, whether I'm going to have to pay And they off. know that a lot of people think, I can't be bothered. Yes, no, they do. Absolutely. I mean, one thing that really bothers me, if, if Michael Gove wants to express concern for the elderly, is the social isolation that these things engender as well. Could because be. it's just another thing where we're interacting with the screen rather than interacting yeah. with the person. So you go to a number of the local shops near me now and there just isn't even the option to pay with a cashier mm. um, for your, your, whatever you're buying. You know, you have to use one of these self-service checkouts. And you you just think for some people that might be really the only conversation yeah. they might yeah. have. And they're trying to kill cash. The yeah. Yeah. Trying to kill but cash. also, you know, people there are lots of shops now who don't take cash. Mm. Outrageous. And, and Boy, I've them. stopped saying to them, you know, do you take cash? Because it gives them a chance to say, no, now I just say, that's all I've got. We went yeah. out for tea last night because it was my littlest uh, birthday. So I had two, three pensioners and six kids at the table in the pub. Is there a waitress? No, there isn't. You have to have the app. Mm. Oh, I'd leave go somewhere so, else. So my other half and I start, we're trying to do the app. We're going, do you want chips with that? Do you want... And I thought, I'm actually being the waitress here. Anyway, yeah. we couldn't manage it to that many people. Yeah. In the end, my mum got a piece of paper out of her handbag, handed me a pen, <laughs> tried, write it down, and we went old school. And within five minutes, I'd done everybody's order. I went up to the bar and I said, I'm not doing it on you, silly app. Right, right. Yeah. Can we order right. it like this? And yeah. that's the only way we're going to stop it, because if people won't spend money in these places, yeah. they if, will if, have to if be... If we go there. into an app, only restaurant or cafe, we're out at the door. Well, but, but the trouble is councils want this parking thing to be cashless because then they don't have to have as many parking attendants, they don't have to apply yes. as many people, it's easier for them. And it's the same in shops. They don't want to have to go to the bank at the end of the day, mm. so they say we don't take cash. And, but gonna, it will drive people online. Yeah, I'm going to find out whether it is illegal for them to refuse your cash. Because mm -hmm. I'm sure it can't be. No. It can't mm. be illegal. So we just insist. Know. But yeah. I think the point you make, Bev, there about how you feel like you're the waitress in that yeah. circumstance, mm. this is so true. True. See, when I go to the shop now, I feel as if I'm doing the checkout. We are. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're We're not getting paid for it. Really. It's no more cheap. Exactly. Yeah. And this is our time. You go this to WH Smith and they things. point you to the self service and say, Why are you putting yourself out of job? I'm going to go to the till. Yeah, yeah no. Can I'm no. paying cash? No, but, but more and more of our time is used up doing other people's jobs. Mm. And, do you know, there's part of me wouldn't mind quite so much if it meant that we got a discount on the things we're yes. buying. Yeah, the yeah, food yeah. in That's cafes and restaurants or supermarkets mm. was cheap to acknowledge the fact yeah. that we are or doing that job. Or if it was even job. quicker mm -hmm. or more convenient, because these things mm -hmm. are sold under the idea that it's convenient. It's never more convenient. It's never quicker. No. Whenever we do the self-checkout, there's always a couple there's of people a, having to go around it, yeah. because you stand there and it's unexpected ice cream bagging area or you've bought a yeah. bottle of wine and they have... It doesn't work. And also <laughs> when people... If you're going into a, get, getting a train and people are using their phone mm -hmm. with a ticket and it takes forever. Yeah. Yeah. Why can't you just put the ticket in I your... had like that last week. I'm standing with my ticket against the thing and I'm going... I'm just shouting around me, it doesn't work, yeah, it yeah. doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. And, and someone that's probably eventually... Down to, probably down to you, Carol. <laughs> no, 
wasn't. No, come on. No, you make me look there. technically well, Let's just see how you go this yeah, weekend. Right. Okay, okay. Um, uh, should we talk about the Scotland situation uh, north of the border? Uh, uh, we've not spoken uh, to you uh, about this yet this morning. Um, with Scott, uh, Scott Benton. Uh, sorry. No, uh, which we, 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 we want to do? Scott Benton. No, let's talk about Scotland. Let's talk about Sturgeon. Scotland. Well, we've done that. Rather. Let's we do have done okay, that. Let's we do can, it again. We've got let's new viewers at this time. Who thought you'd see a forensic tent in the front garden of who, until a few weeks ago, was the longest serving Prime Minister, First Minister in Europe. Yeah, no, it, it's it's absolutely shocking. The front page of every paper. Yes, it, well, it is. It's on the front page of lots of them, but not all of them. Should and, be. And, you, and you're right, it absolutely should be. I mean, this is a shocking thing. And they're saying the tent's been erected so that they can keep the, the eyes of the press uh, uh, off things that documents that are being brought out of Please. the Sturgeon's house. Searching her bins. Yeah, yeah. But but Sturgeon, Burrell, I mean the very fact that they are married, that they've been in this long term relationship and, and they are, had the Scottish National Party stitched up essentially between the two of them. Mm -hmm. They had complete control over what was happening in that political party. That mm -hmm. should not be allowed to happen. I think I think she'll be questioned by the police too. Oh I, I hope think so. That's absolutely what I, she's I mean I think there's a, the, the police have an absolute duty to question although by the way it's looking like it's working because questions are being asked now whether the election of the new leader the, of, the, of the first minister was put off to allow that to happen. So if that's the, we have to find that out first because in that case, any question by the police is irrelevant. If the police are in their pockets, if the police are doing their bidding, the SNP's bidding, it, it, there's no point. But I mean, to me, this is just the most delicious irony that this is the woman who, any. MP, any Westminster MP or politician or minister who put a foot wrong, Sturgeon was on their necks like a rat up a drain. Moral and, paragon. And, and, yeah, and she's now up to, you know, she might not have known about the missing money, about the 600 grand, but the bottom line is that party stinks. Everything mm. it does stinks and the, everyone in it is the same thing. And I just think it's incredible. She was going on about Boris being, you know, the, the, the lowest of the loafer, mm. maybe having a piece of birthday cake, which you never had, and a glass of Prosecco. And look what her party's up to. If I was in Scotland now, I'd be demanding an election. I think that's what the Scottish people need because they've had this continuity candidate yeah. in yeah. terms of use of foisted upon them, voted in by a tiny number of people yeah. in a very rush, snap election. You know, with no real credibility, as far as I'm yeah. concerned, and mm. off the back of, of all of this uh, dispute with, with, with Sturgeon, you know, I, I think the Scottish people deserve better. And, you know, I pointed this out in the mail. When um, uh, Sturgeon, every time... So when Theresa May came in, mm. she demanded a general election. Absolutely. When yeah, um, yeah. Boris Johnson came in, demanded a general election. Liz Truss, yeah. she demanded a general election. Every time. Doesn't apply in Scotland. Yeah, but and, and this the new guy, you know, he's not going. He's not going to do it because he's he's lucky to be in there in the first place. He's mm. scraped in by a tiny, tiny, the tiniest minorities because the, the Scottish public, the people in general, not the party, the public, they wanted Kate Forbes uh, because she's she's kind of she's not like lunatic SNP like they are. And you know they will forgive the SNP. They're the hardcore nationalists because they just want an independent Scotland. Which thank God. Is a million miles away now. It's not going so happen. far away now, isn't it? Yeah. Well, will, will he have to answer questions? Do you think about how much he knew about the new leader? The new oh, leader. So. Yes, because completely. he was her candidate. He was her choice. As, as Joe says, and he was the continued. He's yeah. been in the cabinet since I think 2010. Yes, so completely. he's a key player. Yes, uh, and and this is a big shadow over his leadership. And remember, he was the one the the party, the SNP, wanted to put in there, and, and mm. like almost yeah. shoved in there. So yeah, I mean, he mm. he must know as much as Stu and you, one would imagine. Um, and all of them should be in there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to see Marilla <sighs> dragged off yesterday, arrested, I, I mean, I was cheering. And no, she, and she left the cheering. house... 28 minutes after the police yeah. arrest. No, it, yeah, no, it's disgusting. It's, she it's, must have yeah. known. Absolutely, it yeah. really stinks. And I and I, th I think you're absolutely right. Hamza Yusuf, he must be up to his neck in yes. all of this as well. But of course, we're all talking about this, and, and quite right, you know, this is an absolute scandal and it's important that we talk about it. But there's another layer of what's going on in Scotland, I think, that also yes. is scandalous. You know, the, the NHS waiting list yeah. times are worse yeah. than in England. Yeah. The number of people dying from drug-related deaths in Scotland is, is at record in the Highest whole in of Europe. Europe. Yeah. I mean, these things things are absolutely scandalous. The schools, the education system has gone downhill. You know, there is nothing in Scotland, it doesn't seem to me, and that, that's actually worse but, but properly that's what, as you'd expect. That's what makes it all the more surprising that when the, the, the last election that the SNP get voted back in, knowing the appalling record. I mean, it's ne Scotland is nearly bust. You know, she, was their, their GDP. she was a brilliant communicator. But she, well, she was. She, she used to talk but, her way out of things. Yeah. I yeah. used to wonder how she got out. Well, I know she exactly got out how she got out. It was very obvious what she would do. She 
she would always just point the finger at Westminster. Yes, always, yeah. That was her key yes. card. We're yes. not London. Yes. We're not Westminster. But they were and devolved. to work. It's, it was a stupid mm. argument because Scotland was devolved mm. by fell, health and education. But they fell for it because yeah. she kept winning. Well, yeah, but how, how do people voting for them fall for it? I don't get it. And they will get in again with a majority. I mean, I don't, I don't, they will. I mean, do you just, think they will? Yes, I do. Do you? I do. Yeah, but, I but, do. but there'll be more Labour MPs in Scotland next yes. general election yes. and that's yes. going to make that's it sure. much more difficult for the Tories yeah. to yeah. hold on. And this could deliver victory for Sir Keir Starmer. Uh, can I, I ask like you me. about your Easter plans? It's Thursday, yes. it's Bank yes. Holiday Friday tomorrow. What are you doing, Carol, at the well, weekend? Well, sadly, I'm going to be with him. Um, <laughs> he's coming up to, he's coming to our house with a couple of other friends and uh, bring your own booze because I, I know will. how much you get through. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're doing that and there'll be lots of chocolate and lots of... Well, I won't be eating the chocolate, but no, I'm, but, I'm bringing you an Easter egg, Malone. Uh, how about <laughs> you, you Joe? Well, yeah. I said to Carol just before we came on air that I've got eight hot cross buns at home that I'll, uh, with Is my that name it? on. You can do better. Oh, eight of them, oh, eight of them <laughs> more for you. Eight of them with my name on. We were talking about the best way, you know, do you want salted caramel in them? Do you want a savoury Joe, or just Joe doesn't butter. like that. She oh. just wants... Butter. Plain but I, I want butter. apple Tasted salted butter. caramel. I want no, <laughs> good butter. And what are you doing? Additional hot cross bun. I'm going to be chasing the kids around the garden quite a bit. My mum's got an egg hunt planned. They've good. been trying to do the kids have been mithering for the egg hunts. There's like six little girl cousins mithering for the egg hunt since midweek Wednesday. <laughs> Can we do it today, Nana? Can we do it today, Nana? Uh, and she's made them hang out to the weekend. And then, as I said, I'm walking the Catalonian coast with my gorgeous other half next week. Which class. Simon Calder said is a fabulous, fabulous part of the world. So, That's it. I'm not We've here come this to week. the end of our show. For the week. Next week, huh? Bev's not with me next week. I'm here with Dawn Neeson. Uh, coming up next, it is GB News Live with Mark Longhurst. Have a great weekend. Hi there, it's Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Wednesday's rain is clearing now, but heavy showers follow for many of us. In between, some bright spells and certainly feeling warmer compared with yesterday. The weather fronts that pushed the rain in during Wednesday are now clearing, but they're slowing down, and so some persistent rain lingering for the far northeast of Aberdeenshire into Orkney and Shetland through the rest of the morning. And for the first part of the afternoon as well, Shetland keeps the rain throughout the day. Elsewhere, a brighter sky, still a lot of cloud and some showers. The liveliest downpours likely across central and southern as well as eastern parts of England where could be some thunderstorms in places, even some hail. But away from the showers, sunshine and temperatures up to 15 or 16 Celsius in the south. Feeling colder where we've got that uh, persistent rain towards the northeast of Scotland. That continues into the evening but it eventually fizzles out overnight across Shetland. A lot of cloud remains in the North Sea but elsewhere showers die away and the clouds disappear. As a result, a frosty night to come in rural spots and even in towns and cities, temperatures dipping to two to four Celsius. So chilly starts to Good Friday, but actually for most, it's a sunny start and long spells of sunshine continue through the morning and into the afternoon for the vast majority. One exception, some of these North Sea coastal counties where we're going to see low cloud reappear through the day, some mistiness around the beaches and some drizzle. That's going to make it feel colder, 10 to 12 Celsius on the North Sea coast, but where we've got the sunshine elsewhere, 12 to 16 degrees. So a pleasant afternoon to come for the vast majority. And that continues into the evening as well as much of the weekend. Saturday and Sunday are looking like a repeat performance with plenty of warm, sunny spells across the UK. Still some of that low cloud affecting North Sea coasts. By Monday, a spell of rain followed by showers. Bye-bye. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no 